Okay, you may start now. I would like to call to order the meeting of the Committee of the Whole for Wednesday, October 25th, 2023. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Alderman Switzer. Present. Alderman Oldenburg. Alderman Cohn. Alderman Narayan. Alderman Balmer. Alderman Velasquez. Alderman Sanye. Present. Alderman Spencer. Alderman Browning. Present. Alderman Clark Hubbard. Here. Alderman Keys. Here. Here. Thank you. Alderman Tyus. Alderman Boyd. Alderman Aldrich. President Green. Present. Alderman Oldenburg. Alderman Cohn. Alderman Narayan. Alderman Balmer. Alderman Velasquez. Present. Alderman Spencer. Alderman Tyus, Alderman Boyd, Alderman Aldrich. Present. A present, you have quorum. Madam Clerk, off here. Thank you. Nine present, you have quorum. A quorum being present, we will dispense with line items number two and three. Um, I will move agenda item number six before item number four. We have a, a presentation by, by Christine Garmendia of President Green's office to share the data so far gathered from the community engagement website and other related matters. I'm gonna ask that members of the committee of the whole hold your questions until line item number seven. Thank you, Chair. I'm gonna share my screen. And um, Alders, the, this file is in your, in the folder. It's, um, we tried to include another, the last few paper surveys that arrived today. So the numbers will be a teeny, teeny bit different, um, but we'll get you an updated copy as soon as this meeting is adjourned. So again, thank you, everyone. My name is Christina Garmendia. I'm the policy director um, in President Green's office and have been overseeing the community engagement efforts for the RAM settlement. Um, the survey um, was open, uh, the kickoff survey was open from August 15th through October 20th. This was in, uh, this is an extension of one week from the original time period. Um, thanks to the suggestion of Alders here at the last committee of the whole meeting. Um, and so we've been working busily over the weekend and the early part of this week to prepare this the analysis for you today. There will be an accompanying report that will, um, we're, we're um, wrapping it up now. We'll have it out to you by the end of the week and put it on the portal as well. The ideas portal, um, we'll give an update on the ideas portal as well, um, but that will remain open until uh, next summer. So there's no deadline um, required for people to submit ideas by, uh, but the survey has closed um, and there will be certainly future opportunities for community engagement. Um, in that kick, as a reminder, in that kickoff survey um, was focused on understanding uh, resident challenges. And we asked three questions, uh, three main questions there. We asked uh, res uh, people, participants to 
tell us challenges they have recently experienced or are currently experiencing. We gave them a selection of 25 challenge statements to choose from, um, and it was always intended to be kind of a brainstorm, you know, a kickoff um, because we, the next question was a write-in to solicit any additional challenges that people wanted to share um, that they are experiencing. And then the last question in the kickoff survey was around challenges that people you know experience, um, a similar, uh, the same statements. Um, and then the ideas portal, um, we asked, what is your idea for the RAM settlement? And so we've been uh, getting some great feedback um, and insight there. And first off, I want to congratulate and thank all the residents of the city of St. Louis um, and members of this board for getting the word out um, and all the organizations that help get the word out about our pilot for this public engagement hub with um, our pilot with Citizen Lab. Um, and I'm share, sharing a couple screen grabs here. Um, we've had uh, have over 3,600 uh, registered users on our portal, and I've included a snapshot of two other cities that have been um, that are partners of Citizen Lab. So in comparison, Seattle, a much bigger city than us, has um, just over 2,000 participants and Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which has a, um, a significant engagement platform usage is just over 2,500. So, and this is in just the first two months. So um, big kudos to St. Louisans for your engagement on this issue. And so again, we have um, just over 3,600 registered users on Citizen Lab, um, and we're very excited about this pilot for the Board of Aldermen. And since the last meeting, we've had an additional 1,400 people join, um, and we're really hopeful that this is um, a long-term investment, and this will be just the beginning of engagement, sustained engagement for residents of St. Louis. We also, in response to um, some of the, the first month that the survey was open um, and the platform was open, um, we uh, put it together a plan to do special outreach and uh, put together a paper survey, a version of the survey, um, and the ideas portal. So all four of those questions were included in the paper survey. And those were distributed through a partnership with St. Louis Public Libraries, uh, recreation centers, um, uh, alders would bring them to ward meetings, and there was door-to-door -door canvassing focused on increasing Black participation, which is something we identified as a need in the last the last check-in. And so I would like to give a uh, update on just who participated in the survey. We had just uh, under 3,200 survey responses. Um, of which, um, so since the last time we checked in, that's more than 1,300 additional ones since September. Um, the majority of these were online. So uh, of these, 2,851 were online surveys using the Citizen Lab portal. And then we received 344 paper surveys, which our team <laughs> very quickly <laughs> in um uh, uploaded um, into a database so that we can include them in this analysis today, including the write-in responses. So um, I want to take a step back and just talk a little bit about, you know, we uh, had to make some choices um, in the course of our engagement, community engagement and outreach. And one of those choices was to make demographic questions optional. Um, and the idea behind that was to reduce burden on survey respondents. Uh, but what it means is that we don't have a perfect picture of who took the survey. Um, we do, um, we did want to include it and have it be optional so we could have um, an indicator of whether we were on the right track. Um, but for reference, we uh, optionally, uh, it was not required of uh, participants to share, but many of them did. Their race, age, household income, ward, and their relationship to the city, whether they're a resident um, or a uh, whether they worked in the city or whether they were just a visitor or fan. <laughs> and so for reference, um, I'll just be sharing to, in the presentation today about our race 
outcomes, but in the report, I'll give the full breakdown of what we know about these other uh, demographic indicators. So um, St. Louis, as of 2022 um, American Community Survey one-year estimates is about 46% um, white and 42% Black or African-American um, with a smattering of um, other racial groups, including Asian, some other race, um, uh, Native Hawaiian, uh, Pacific Islander, and American Indian. The So who took the survey? Um, like I mentioned before, um, it was not required to share your race. Um, so 28.7% of participants did not um, indicate any race. Um, but we had 48% uh, of those who, um, of all participants identified as white, 17% identified as Black or African American. So because, um, so this is not perfectly representative um, compared to what our population is. Um, instead of it being roughly 50-50 white and Black, we are seeing more of, uh, you know, there's a third of Black re residents compared to for every one uh, white resident that participated. So we are gonna pull out um, the results just for uh, people who identified as Black or African-American and share those with you here and in the report. And so otherwise, just a overview, who else took the survey? Um, Age-wise, um, we saw uh, uh, because of the prevalence of the online survey results, um, middle-aged people in their 30s, 40s, 50s were um, well represented in the survey, um, but our youngest residents, um, people in their 20s, and then our oldest residents are were less likely to take the survey. Income-wise, um, this is something I previewed last time as a likely just outcome of any kind of community engagement effort, wealthier residents are more likely to participate. And so that is still the case. Um, uh, we had less lower income residents take the survey. And then ge geographic wise, um, many people, as it turns out with the ward transition this year, a lot of people don't know their new ward number um, and, and or didn't share it. So, but we were able to calculate the ward count from those who did submit their street addresses. And, um, and of course um, there were uh, a number of people who did know their ward and shared that with us. So the map here on the right um, sh shows you the rough distribution of the survey responses. Um, so we did have uh, participation from across the city, um, but with concentrations of high participation in um, parts of South City as and in the Central West End. Oops, so, um, brief breakdown for the benefit of our alders here today. Um, again, this is only uh, 60. We only have the geographic data for 60% of the participants. So this is not the entire survey population. Um, and we know, um, so, so this is the breakdown. And um, I wanted to highlight here um, that in uh, certain north side wards, I mentioned before that we had a specific canvassing effort to increase Black participation that focused on canvassing in wards 11 or 10, 11, 12, and 13. And you can see how uh, prevalent or this, how significant having a canvassing effort uh, was to get representation from those wards in the results. So uh, thank you to everyone who helped get the word out uh, in your awards. And this is, again, a touchstone, I hope, in the future phases of this engagement that we continue to improve representation across the wards and have it be more equal. All right, so going from here to our findings. So as a reminder, we uh, a goal for the RAMP settlement funds that we've heard from our leadership thus far is to use, that we want to use the funds to help solve big challenges that impact city residents. And so in this kickoff survey, we provided that initial list of 25 different statements for residents to select from regarding challenges they might have on the topics of employment, 
housing, transportation, childcare, education, health and healthcare, and very popular city services, which in ours, we included um, options around uh, streets and emergency response, which includes 911 and police. Um, and our number one uh, selection was, uh, my car has been damaged by poorly maintained roads and streets. Uh, and 42% of our survey response respondents um, stated that they personally experienced this challenge. Um, I, for one, can attest to this happening to me. <laughs> then, um, and also more than half of survey respondents um, had this, uh, personally experienced this challenge or it happened to someone they knew. Number two was, I have student loan debt. Number three, and I'll show an overview of all these um, two in a second. Number three, I have not received a timely or appropriate emergency response when calling 911. And then 28% of survey respondents personally experience this challenge. Then number four, I have other outstanding debts. Number five, I have a low paying job. And so 41% of our survey respondents uh, shared that they know someone um, in there that they care about who experiences this challenge. And so here's an overview of uh, the top half. Um, so these are all the statements which, for which we received um, over 1,000 uh, votes for, I don't know the right word there, but um, these are the most common challenges for St. Louisans. Um, and so beyond these top five, we had um, People were unhappy with their children's education, uh, poor, they, that they had poor mental health, medical debt, uh, unaffordable housing, safe places, they lacked safe places to play, um, they, la they didn't had unaffordable childcare, um, they lacked reliable transportation and poor physical health. So here you can see kind of the relationship between people who said that they personally um, experience this challenge versus um, some experience by someone that they know. And um, I'm going to just break this down just a little bit for you. Uh, when you compare to how people answer themselves and versus how they answer for people that they know, there's a lot of overlap. So these there's seven, the ones that are highlighted green here are the ones that are common across these two, um, the two questions, um, though a slightly different order. And then what's highlighted in yellow under personally experienced are the ones that only um, show up in the top 10 for uh, challenges that people personally experienced. They include things like medical debt. Um, that makes sense that you would more likely to know about your own medical debt than anyone else's. Um, that the lack of safe places to play and then access a lack of access to healthy food. And then when we're looking at uh, what people uh, how they responded to challenges experienced by others, you can see that they um, put in uh, things like unaffordable housing, that they're familiar with people having challenges with reliable transportation and um, lack of access to affordable childcare. And like I said, um, I we wanted to pull out the answers uh, provided by our survey respondents who identify as Black or African American, of which we had um, 537. And so this is how this um, lineup, the uh, their selection of challenge statements uh, looks like in comparison. Uh, and I'll, I'll compare it to our all the everyone who took the survey. But here you can see the the number one uh, topic was other outstanding debts. Um, and just a brief note on what this means, other outstanding debts um, refers to, so in comparison to medical debt or student loan debt, this is more like consumer debt and um, auto loan debt. So this is a, a very common problem for across the city um, and particularly for 
our Black residents. Uh, followed by student loan debt, um, having your car damaged by poor quality streets, low paying job, medical debt, unemployment, unaffordable housing, reliable transportation, poor physical health, safe places to play, and poor 911 response. So it was interesting. I found most interesting about the difference between um, the entire survey population and Black residents is that poor 911 response is still an important challenge that people face, but it falls uh, almost down to the uh, off the top 10 for them. And again, comparing the how people answered between personal experiences and experienced by others in the community, still a lot of overlap. The blue is the overlap. Um, there's six overlapping issues here. And then the differences, um, effort, Black residents were more likely to share that they personally experienced having medical debt, uh, suffering from poor, nine, they experienced poor 911 response, lack of access to healthy food, and lack of safe places to play for their children, while reporting for others and in their community that um, they knew people who um, were challenged by unemployment, reliable transportation, and poor physical health. So um, we the second question in the kickoff survey was a write-in, um, so people could share what other challenges that they faced. Last time I gave a preview that um, one of the common themes in these in the write-in responses um, was about public safety. And um, so as of today, we had 857 write-in responses of which 248 of them mentioned crime in some way. So this includes both general perceptions of crime um, uh, and then more specifically, um, a number of people reporting that they personally experienced car break-ins or theft or other property crime. Public safety, um, we had 207 mentions and what uh, I wanna distinguish between crime and public safety because public safety included uh, people sharing th their challenges with reckless drivers and reckless driving and challenge with pedestrian and bicyc bicyclist safety and um, lack of police response. Then lastly, um, the biggest, uh, the third biggest theme across all these write-in responses was on other city services. So we already shared about what people had to say about 911 and streets and street infrastructure. Uh, the next kind of uh, most common issues with city services included uh, or concerns included water and sewer infrastructure, trash pickup, tree maintenance and uh, uh, city support for a animal shelter. So, and so we'll dig more into this into the report. We just wanted to give you a quick overview today. And so some of the next steps for this, the survey for the ideas portal, we're at the current phase we're in now is uh, selecting priority challenges. Um, we hope that the survey, um, which had more than 3,000 residents participate in, um, informs the Board of Aldermen on the selection of priority challenges that we can focus future engagement efforts on. Um, we, I'm sharing the results here, previewing them for you here, and then there'll be a report posted on the Citizen Lab portal, um, hopefully by the end of the week, but fingers crossed. Um, and so, that this is um, kind of the current phase we're in is we really need to, uh, we would like to see um, some focus on uh, priority challenges for us to focus the additional discussion on the RAM settlement use of the funds for. Um, what we propose, uh, what we plan on next is uh, the next phase of community engagement. We'll start on November 8th, um, where we share ideas that um, we've identified that match um, or that respond to the priority challenges identified in this phase. And so the public will be given the opportunity to give feedback on the ideas that we've received so far that address the selected priority challenges um, and to share any additional ideas. Um, so, and this is the opportunity for residents to, give, to ask questions about proposals or about ideas. 
Um, and so that we can in either the idea champions that the people who posted those ideas or city officials can look into um, getting those questions answered to um, inform your support of those ideas. And so starting in December through the end of January, we plan to have a voting period. Um, so all of this thus far has been discussion. Uh, brainstorming is the ideas portal kind of has been in this brainstorming phase and discussion discourse on individual ideas and but, but starting in December we want to give residents um, the opportunity to vote and to formally show their support for the ideas that address the priority challenges and this is when um, idea champions are, um, will be asked to present their ideas to the public via in-person and online board of aldermen hearings in the spring of next year um, and again, outside of all of this community engagement, there's a lot of work going on. Um, so information gathering on the part of our staff here at the Board of Aldermen um, and uh, around evaluating ideas for feasibility, the um, cost pricing, alternative financing, all these other kinds of things that uh, we as city staffers can look into. And so I wanna give a short update um, about the ideas portal. And uh, so since last month's meeting, we've received 620 ideas, um, an additional 268 since last month. And we uh, achieved one of our goals of having more than 1000 people contribute to the ideas portal. So contribute, uh, contributions mean you know people have submitted, commented, or showed their support ideas for ideas. And so, just to preview, kind of the next phase of the work is um, after the board of aldermen has selected priority challenges, um, and the board of A, &A um, select their priority challenges that they want to see the ramp settlement address. We can now start uh, brainstorming or idea matching with. Uh, you know, what ideas would lead to generational change for that priority challenge. And so just going from our first option, a street infrastructure, um, we actually had a lot of ideas related to street infrastructure. There was over 40 ideas just on street repair, street infrastructure. Um, so I, I'm not sharing all of them here today. Um, uh, so, but People were advocating for improved streets in various locations of the city from downtown to North St. Louis, um, even naming specific streets that needed um, help. <laughs> um, but I just wanted to highlight this idea um, as an example of one that could lead to uh, generational change for street infrastructure, which is submitted by Liz Kramer on behalf of the Community Mobility Committee, um, an idea about dedicating funding and staff for rapid response traffic calming. So piloting traffic calming um, in areas with um, high rates of pedestrian and cyclist collisions. So what ideas would we, uh, would lead to generational change for city services? Um, one of the um, ideas we wanted to highlight today was the uh, establishment of a municipal endowment fund. This was submitted by two different people, three different people. Uh, separately. So Lucas Strip Matter, Dominic Seeker, and Matt Elliott. And um, what this idea is about is not spending the money right away, but instead investing it in a higher yield fund and um, taking either, um, there's different variation and ideas submitted here, but either only um, taking from the interest or um, having the fund sit for a number of years to, in order to double it. Um, and uh, and withdraw at, from it at a later date so that it could last for a longer period of time, um, but using it to focus on supplementing city services. And then uh, just giving a sample of these ideas today. So there's so many. Um, uh, another idea we wanted to highlight related for uh, to address student loan debt was to invest in trade apprenticeships or sc and schools. This is submitted by um, one, two, three, four, five different residents um, around uh, you know, this being a generational investment 
um, and a potential use for the RAMP settlement to address things like student loan debt, as well as um, city employee hiring um, and employment. And uh, another fun one we wanted to preview was, um, and this this uh, access to childcare came in kind of toward, uh, around the number 10 spot for residents as their top challenge. Um, so what ideas would lead to generational change for access to childcare? Um, we received set many people submitting um, some variation of city subsidized early child care. And I encourage you to everyone to look into these ideas on the portal. Um, and one uh, thing we'll be doing over the coming weeks is really digging into the ideas and um, identifying kind of the similarities and differences between the proposals uh, here. And then uh, lastly, another idea in this category was um, more city support for after-school care, um, particularly ARCHES, which is city-funded after-school care. And that was submitted by three different uh, residents as well. So we want to thank um, all the participants so far in the ideas portal. This is really just the tip of the iceberg of the types of responses and ideas that people are bringing to the table. And um, and I wanted to just reiterate our next steps for the coming weeks is to select the priority challenges and to elevate those ideas that respond to those challenges in the next phase of engagement. And I want to remind people and encourage you to, if you haven't joined Citizen Lab yet, um, to register now. And um, while the survey has closed, you can still register in order to post an idea, provide feedback on the ideas of others, uh, receive notifications when things are changing or happening. And so you can scan this QR code now with your phone um, and it'll take you directly to the portal. Um, so we look forward to seeing you there. Um, it's been, um, we've gotten so much response and it's a little challenging sometimes to keep up with email. Um, so by putting your ideas in Citizen Lab, it makes sure that there's more eyes um, and that there's some accountability on whether your idea has been seen and, and evaluated. So we appreciate all of you. And we'll be having a public comment period later today on these priority challenges. Um, so we encourage um, our residents to share the challenges that you think the RAM settlement should focus on solving. Was there a challenge missing that you thought should be considered and why should city leadership consider it? And is there a challenge that was shared here that isn't a good fit for the RAM settlement? So with that, um, I am um, going to be ceding the floor back to the chair, um, but we have some other speakers from um, our uh, mayor's office and, and the comptroller herself. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Garmendia, for all of that information. Again, all, those, um, all of that information, that presentation is available to you. If you have any trouble finding it or unable to locate it, please um, let me know. Or if you have any additional questions about any of the information, always feel free to send that over in an email. Um, for the next part of our meeting, we are honored to have one of the longest serving elected officials present today, um, Madam Comptroller. She's going to speak to us and give us some of her some remarks and some of her thoughts on the RAM settlement and this process that we have going on. So, Madam Comptroller, I will pass things over to you. Thank you and good evening uh, to everyone who's uh, tuned in. I am... Um, asked to give a brief uh, synopsis of the, of the city's financial condition while uh, making remarks regarding the uh, RAM settlement. So I'll be very brief, uh, starting with the fiscal year uh, end, uh, how we ended our fiscal year end uh, is just simply, uh, we had an operating uh, balance of 71.4 million where the revenues exceeded the expenditures for the year by 34 million dollars our total expenses were 42 million below the budget estimates and that's because we have a high a vacancy rate in terms of our our positions so we have a 
a challenge there uh, filling our positions in each department of the city, or at least nearly each department of the city. As you know, by ordinance, half of our ending uh, balance, the 71.4 million, will go to the capital fund, while the other half will go to the uh, reserves for the city. That has increased our reserves to $128 million, which is 22% of our budget. And when we talk about capital funds, we know that we have a rough estimate of capital needs of $500 million. And while we're on the topic of the capital funds for the city, or capital needs, that is, for the city, we know that part of the funding for capital needs comes from the half cent sales tax. In each ward, we know we have a certain amount of, cap of the half cent sales tax dedicated to each ward. And in the past, that was distributed among 28 wards. Now there's a redistribution, which I understand is taking place in this session to uh, reduce the uh, amount from 28 wards to 14 wards. And I understand a committee is handling a fair uh, reallocation or redistribution by taking an overlay of the new ward boundaries over the old ward boundaries so that a fair reallocation of the balances that was held by the old ward, the old 28 wards, will now uh, remain in those uh, locations, those uh, bounded boundaries of the old ward. Um, which is a fair uh, redistribution of the balances of the half and sales tax. I wanted to just make that point. I understand the committee is handling that. And while I get back to the overall city finances, I can definitely report that all three credit rating agencies uh, have an A rating for the city of St. Louis. We're in the A category with an A-plus rating from the Standard and Poor's. We have had an increase, a rating increase from the Moody's, as well as from the Fitch credit rating agencies, one increase in May and one increase in September of this year. Our total debt for the city of St. Louis is $1.5 billion, with the bulk of that coming uh, from our enterprise funds, the airport, and parking. That 60% of the debt is from those funds that are enterprise funds, and those enterprise funds are airport and parking. And only 5% of the overall city debt is come from general obligation of bonds. That's only 5%. City buildings also make up the part of the 60% of the debt of the 1.5 million, which I talked about. Uh, so you got city buildings and enterprise funds that makes up 60% of the debt. And then we want to go quickly to um, the RAM settlement, which is 250, 280 million, uh, which 30 million of that going and is uh, dedicated to the convention center, which leaves 250 million to be allocated citywide. And you've just heard about some of the uh, ideas that the uh, citizens have for that uh, use of this 250 million for the RAM settlement citywide. But I wanna get to uh, the ARPA funding that the city has received as I wrap up my comments on the city of finances. The city, as you know, has received ARPA funding uh, because of the COVID. We've received $490 million, which is double the amount of the RAM settlement. We received $249 million of that in uh, 
fiscal 21, that was June uh, fiscal 21, and then the next half, which is the 249 million, was received in fiscal 22, which was June of uh, fiscal 22, 2022. So we have a total of four, 498 million double the RAM settlement. And here's the breakdown of what has happened with those fundings uh, since then, since the receipt. Uh, so as I said, two years ago, uh, in 2021, we received the first half of 498 million, then we received the second half. As of October 1, we have expended less than one quarter of the total 498 million. That's uh, roughly $85 million has been expended. The other part I will say about these uh, ARPA fundings is less than one half of the total has been committed. And that's 126 million. All total of what has been expended and what has been committed is $211 million, which overall is less than half of the total received. What still is available and remaining for being committed um, of ARPA funds is $287 million, which is more than the RAM settlement of $250. We have $287 million to be expended. Now, why I'm taking time uh, on this particular issue is because there is a deadline associated with the uh, ARPA funding, and that deadline is one year from now, one year and a couple of months, uh, which is December 2024, the ARPA funds must be committed. Then, uh, out deadline a couple of years later, not only should these uh, funds be committed, but they should be extended by December 2026. So I'm issuing a financial urgency message regarding the attention that all elected officials uh, the representing the city of St. Louis would have in terms of focus on the opportunity that the city has to make sure that we are responsible and committing these dollars throughout the city of St. Louis citywide to the necessary uh, needs throughout the city. We've done a job, which is a good job so far, uh, but two years have gone and we have not committed half. We have more than half to commit, uh, as I mentioned, 287, which um, uh, is, is a huge amount, more than the 250 million of the RAM settlement. So 287 million of ARPA funding remain uncommitted, must be committed by December of 2024, again, I issue an urgency, a financial urgency, simply because there is a deadline associated with committing these dollars. And the process, as you can see, is a long process. Uh, it has been two years it took just to spend 200, well, to expend 85 million and to commit another 126. So that total is 211. It took two years, but we have less than two years to commit even more. And that, again, I'll mention the amount, 287 million by automatic um, ordinances. We commit these dollars and we have less than two years to work on committing uh, an amount larger than we've committed so far, and it took us two years to do that. So that's the reason for the urgency, is simply the timing uh, that's left in terms of the deadline, as well as the fact that government processing takes a long time uh, through the different um, approval processes that this uh, must go through. So I am ending my comments here by uh, just uh, recapping 
that the city finds itself in a positive outlook. We did uh, end the year it, with a positive surplus, and we did divide those dollars between the capital fund and our reserves. Our credit ratings are, remain in the A category. Our debt is uh, is a 1.5 billion. Uh, that is largely made up of those uh, uh, bond issues for city buildings and enterprise funds, a huge amount uh, for the airport. Uh, and then we uh, know that our capital needs are an estimated at 500 million. When we look at that, uh, we look at how can we uh, balance out what our needs are in terms of how we can uh, quickly um, use the ARPA money that we have been, uh, that we have received uh, to possibly uh, tap off some of these capital needs and other needs. So while we are speaking about the RAM funds, uh, there is no deadline associated with the RAM funds. Uh, it is in an uh, interest-bearing account. Uh, our focus really needs to be uh, lending itself to the ARPA funds as the chief financial officer of the city and controller. I urge you to uh, all elected officials to really focus on double down on looking at a pot of money that is larger than the RAMs, uh, which still needs to be expended. Uh, so that is uh, my budget director, my mayor, my president of the board of aldermen, I am issuing this, uh, this urgent uh, message so that our focus uh, should be looking at monitoring these uh, uh, dollars uh, with urgency because some of these allocations may change uh, and we may need to have uh, reallocations. And of course, that takes a Board of Aldermen uh, session to, to take care of. You know, I say session, I mean ordinance. And so we need to make um, make some time for the due to the, the slow government processing, as we all know that exists with any government. There's processing time, there's lag time, as we call it, and we want to be vigilant and and have a, a mindset of using our our, our time wisely, uh, so that these fundings that we've been so fortunate to have been received, to have received from the federal government can be used in our city wisely and timely. Uh, those are the uh, comments that I have uh, today regarding this RAM settlement. Um, and just uh, to reiterate the urgency uh, that we have with regard to funding that is twice the amount of the RAM settlement and that's the ARPA funds. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Madam Comptroller, um, for all of that information. I think you made some excellent, valid points, and thank you for helping to keep our city's A-plus credit. Um, we will move forward now to what many folks in attendance have been waiting on, which is um, public comment and public engagement, the process for community engagement. The meeting is now open for public comment on priority challenges. The procedure to provide testimony is as follows. If you wish to speak, click. Point of order. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. I, I, I got it. Messed the, messed the, the recorder recorder. from the mayor's office. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so we're still in report of officials. And we have um, Casey Milberg, who is the from the mayor's office and is their policy director who's going to speak, um, and honestly, it's a great follow-up point to what Ma Madam Comptroller pointed out. Um, the mayor's office is gonna speak to some things, including some of the expenditures um, that we're currently working on as a city and some of the things that have come up that have um, already been allocated are in the works. So they're gonna provide an update for us in those regards. Um, and Ms. Milberg, I will pass it over to you now. And thank you for joining us. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. And just want to say also thank you so much to Christina Garmenia for that um, really thorough presentation, all the work that's gone into it, and to Comptroller Green. And I will go ahead and share my screen here, and we will go ahead and get started with a presentation. 
So again, the goal of this presentation is going to be sharing some information about city spending um, pertinent to different areas of community interest, um, both that have been highlighted um, by the President's Office in the survey, as well as just some other areas of interest that we commonly hear from citizens. Um, providing some high level insight into fiscal year 24 annual operating budget, um, ARPA appropriations and other funding to provide the comprehensive overview of what funds do we have access to as a city? How are we spending them um, in the most comprehensive way possible? And then just flagging a few big picture fiscal trends that folks who are thinking long-term about how would they recommend investing these funds might wanna monitor. So we're going to start with the fiscal year 24 annual operating budget, and this is going to be broken into, again, those different bucket areas of interest that we know that um, residents have expressed interest in before. General information, total of $1.3 billion in our city's operating budget. Um, we have so far been fortunate to benefit from a healthy economy that's reflected a operating budget increase of 7.3% over the prior fiscal year. And as you just heard the comptroller mention, what that's translated to so far, we have a nice budget reserve of about 22% of our operating expenses that will help us weather whatever economic downturns or sudden challenges we might face a little bit better than we would without it. So the first bucket that we know a lot of folks express interest in is safe neighborhood safety. What does the city budget look like in that way? And when um, we're looking at safety, public safety, we know it takes a lot of different forms. So you can see a few different areas of interest here, whether it's community policing, uh, the Bureau of Investigations, which houses the 911 call center and dispatch, fire and hazardous materials response, um, pre-trial inmate housing and needs, probation and juvenile detention services, safety inspection for new construction, structure rehabilitation, demolition and the board up program, and then uh, the new city emergency siren warning system. We also have other categories, including neighborhood stabilization, fire code enforcement and attendant issues with that public right-of-way safety on streets, alleys, and sidewalks, street and alley easement, um, lighting operation maintenance and repair, the Office of Violence Prevention, compliance with um, certain mechanical, plumbing, and electrical ordinances, updated vehicle, police vehicle, fleet, civilian oversight board, lead abatement um, efforts, and fire safety inspections. So again, safety in our city takes a lot of different forms. It's not just police, it's not just fire. Um, there are a lot of different ways uh, that we fund different um, safety related efforts for the city and the operating budget. Another bucket we hear a lot about, and I know that you know one of the comments um, that was flagged as an area of interest was um, issues relating to children and youth. Um, youth services is certainly an area of interest that we see um, a lot of uh, contact about in the president's office. So recreation centers, what that funding looks like is reflected in this slide. It also includes city funding efforts, also include meals and mentoring programs for youth and families who are exposed to negative risk factors. Um, a child, we have a child support unit in the circuit attorney's office. We have youth empowerment programs, capital improvements and our rec centers are included in this bucket, summer youth jobs and programs for juveniles at the juvenile division of our 22nd judicial circuit court as well. Another category we hear a lot of interest in is equitable health and well-being for all of our residents. Um, and again, there's a lot of different shapes that this takes within the city budget as well to be mindful of. Um, water supply, water for purification services, uh, maintenance um, and services for valves, fire hydrants and water mains, services for older adults, services for our unhoused, communicable, communicable disease control, emergency medical services for city residents, behavioral and public health care services, and lead remediation efforts as well. Other issues that we tackle through the city budget um, that are related to health and well-being for all can include environmental health services, overtime for our EMTs and paramedic EMS providers who are doing great work, necessary work every day, family, community, and school health support for high-risk populations, opioid abuse prevention, uh, the Civil Rights Enforcement Agency, we have a public administrator, we have a treatment court, and then we also have Americans with Disabilities Act compliance services that the city funds as well. 
On the transportation front, we have funds we allocate towards um, our airport to make sure it's operating safely and as efficiently as we can operate it. Uh, maintenance and repair of traffic signal signs and street painting, traffic control signalizing, signing and striping, and street resurfacing repair, other items we fund, uh, citywide road and bridge projects, street engineering and design, street cleaning, and of course, snow removal and flood control are also items that we fund um, that fall into the transportation bucket. I know that there was um, some of the data that the survey was showing is that people are interested in safe um, places for kids to play and just to be out in public. So another bucket of funding that um, we do target as a city through our budget is attractive parks and public spaces. And this includes maintaining attractive, accessible and safe parks and floral beds, uh, urban forestry and tree maintenance and debris and weed control maintaining our vacant occupied properties, including through our LRA and uh, also maintaining alleys, capital improvements and debt service for our city neighborhood parks, towing removal and storage of vehicles and public right of ways, capital improvements and debt service for major city parks, um, protection of city parks, recreation centers and forest facilities, enhanced trash enforcement and enforcement against illegal dumping and prevention of illegal dumping and Operation Brightside graffiti cleanup. On the affordable housing front, uh, we fund development and preservation of affordable and accessible housing. We also fund housing conservation efforts. Refuse is another topic that we know a lot of residents have interest in. Um, we find refuse collection, bulky item collection, uh, replacement of refuse trucks to make sure that they can stay on their routes, recycling services, and then resident and bulk waste disposal. In terms of effective and efficient government, something that we also hear a lot of feedback from citizens about um, operation and maintenance of safe and sanitary city facilities, um, the Citizen Service Bureau, and then we also fund, continue to fund pay increases for employees. Um, you just heard the comptroller mentioned that one of the issues the city currently continues to face is vacancies in certain departments. And so um, the pay increases um, that have been included um, work to try to retain as well as recruit employees for our city so that we can continue to provide services. On to other city funding, because the city operating budget is not uh, the only way that we receive funding. There are some other sources to mention, federal funds, state funds, and then um, mentioning that um, as we're talking about federal funds and state funds, that there are certain city departments that do receive a significant amount of their funding uh, through investments from state and federal funding streams. For example, DHS and DOH are a few. On the federal funds, um, this is just a snapshot, not meant to be the whole picture of it, but just on some items that we know uh, the public have interest in and that um, we know that there's been some interest communicated on the, the survey that's been administered. On the affordable housing front, we're currently administering $80 million in federal funds to support the production and preservation of uh, more than 2,600 affordable housing units. In terms of water infrastructure upgrades, we have a 45 million authorization from the federal government um, to draw down a $5 million increments for water infrastructure improvements. On the community development block grant, which we use for social services, affordable housing and improved infrastructure, we're working with about $26 million on CDBG funds currently. We have a $3.7 million federal appropriation for regional violent crime initiatives that we've been implementing. Um, we have home investment partnership federal funds as well. We also have a, a federal appropriation that we've been implementing for 911 dis dispatch center upgrades. And then uh, EPA Brownfields grant to do some environmental remediation. We have some of those federal funds that we administer for, uh, for those purposes as well. On the state funds, there truly are so many line items in the state budget that go towards many, many wonderful organizations and entities across the region. Not all of, them, not all of this routes through the city. Many of them go directly to, uh, most of them go directly to these entities in the city. But it's still worth mentioning that the city um, continues to be able to make a strong case to the state um, that we are deserving of these significant state investments. Um, this happens across 11, the 11 operating bills at the state level, including one special operating bill. Um, to do a high level summary of the kinds of funding 
funding streams that we and um, our wonderful community organizations and partners receive from the state. Those buckets include um, funding for elementary and secondary education, higher education and workforce development, transportation, uh, debt maintenance, the Edward Jones Dome debt maintenance. Um, the city is getting ready to help us close that out soon, which is great. Uh, sorry, the state's getting ready to help us close that out soon. Agriculture and natural resources. And worth mentioning that we were able to secure a new $5 million investment to shore up the city flood wall and begin doing some critical repairs on that. Uh, economic development, public safety. I know a lot of um, folks on this uh, this meeting are aware that we got a $10 million investment for the public safety answering point um, in the city to consolidate 911 services even further and continue to improve those services. Uh, corrections funding, health and mental health funding, social services funding, um, year-round paid youth jobs and internships. We got an investment from the state of $1 million to continue those city-specific city, city specific services funding for arts and culture. And then of course there's um, ARPA related funding as well. And that's, just, um, and so now onto the city's portion of ARPA appropriations. Um, one thing to highlight, you know, to go into a little bit more detail to build upon what the comptroller shared. So we have currently appropriated $498 million of the ARPA funds that we received. Um, and so for those um, who are not in the, the weeds on um, the difference between appropriation programming and what does that look like? Um, appropriation means that a bill has been passed at the city level to authorize the city to begin to um, expend contract out those funds. So we've done that with $498 million. Um, the board was very busy the past couple of years. You can see all the ordinances in which uh, this $498 million of ARPA was appropriated through. Um, of that, $221 million, about 44.5% has been programmed. And what that means is that those funds have been obligated through contracts with implementation partners. Um, and so in terms of Payments that have been made on those contracts, um, that is currently at about $80 million, $79.4 million. So I know, again, for those who are not really in the weeds on budget, that's those are a lot of different words, but think of it as a three-phase process. We appropriate the funds to give the city authority to contract out. Once we start contracting out um, or you know, working in other ways with departments, we can then start spending it, reimbursing it. So that's the high level of how that works. And then a high level review of what every department has been doing with the 498 million so far that's been um, appropriated. Department of Health, um, you can see how much has been allocated to each department um, of the city's ARPA allocation. Um, they've been focused on COVID-19, behavioral health and community health efforts. The Office of Violence Prevention has done really great work with violence intervention, behavioral health and youth and juvenile diversion. Department of Public Safety has um, focused on uh, critical access dispatch, 911 software, building stabilization, and the real-time crime center. The Department of Human Services has focused on a variety of different services, ranging from rental and utility assistance, mortgage assistance, emergency shelters, safe havens and outdoor spaces, case management, wraparound services, rapid rehousing, permanent supportive housing, bridge housing, and targeted cash assistance. The Affordable Housing Commission has um, used their ARPA funding for public benefits navigators, which has been hugely important to the community um, now that Medicaid uh, re-verifications have begun again with the state. Um, they've also focused the funding on legal assistance, uh, the tiny homes that have gotten some um, attention recently, legal assistant, uh, legal assistance again, mediation, subsidy housing assistance, affordable housing production and preservation. Community Development Administration has received one of the largest allocations, and they've really been doing a fantastic job of pushing that money out the door in impactful ways to the community on affordable housing production and preservation, neighborhood beautification, support for community development corporations, healthy home repair, early childhood education, child care services with community partners, food assistance, a home ownership fund and homeowners insurance, a development fund, and the preservation of historic neighborhoods. The St. Louis Development Corporation has been focused on uh, small business and nonprofit grants and loans, housing development, and technical assistance for um, emerging small businesses and nonprofits. The Planning and Urban Design Agency has largely focused on the sustainability plan update for the city. 
Uh, the Board of Public Service and Streets, um, which has received another large chunk of this funding, has focused on um, sidewalk improvements, plowing streets, arterial street paving and upgrades, bridge repairs, recreation center capital upgrades, fire department capital upgrades, SLMPD uh, capital upgrades, traffic calming, roadway improvements, public safety answering point investments, traffic safety improvements, court capital upgrades, refuse truck and other city operations vehicle upgrades as well. And then Parks, Recreation, and Forestry has focused their funding on learning labs, basketball leagues, behavioral health programming, soccer programming, and uh, hazardous tree removal. Slate has focused their funding on year-round youth jobs, summer youth jobs, case management and wraparound services, adult literacy and skills and education training, as well as CD, uh, uh, commercial driver's license training, CDL training. The Office of the Treasurer has been focused on uh, uh, the Guaranteed Basic Income Pilot Program, which you might have heard a little bit about recently. It is launched this week, and we encourage um, anyone to visit the city website to see if uh, they might be eligible to participate. Um, the Information Technology Services Agency and then the Board of Elections, um, they've been focused on high-speed Wi-Fi and rec centers, data analytics software, electoral infrastructure, election software, and election training. And then in the communications and citywide bucket, which was another distinct bucket, um, those efforts have been largely focused on vaccination, education, and marketing, as well as city employee salary adjustments related to services during COVID. And then the smallest bucket, and rightfully so, and appropriately so, has been the administrative oversight over this funding. So um, city efforts to track and monitor and all of that. And then on to some fiscal trends, just to get on folks' radar. Um, you, you probably have heard a lot about the earnings tax in recent months. It comprises more than a third of the city's budget. Um, there have been some recent court cases that have um, raised some questions about um, who can pay the earnings tax, remote work, and those lines. Those have not yet been settled. We are waiting for that decision to come down for the court. Um, but all that to say that there could be some court decisions that have the potential to impact what the city's earnings tax revenues might look like moving forward. And then there are some uh, emerging efforts in Jefferson City to um, try to uh, define or tweak the way that both the city of Kansas City and the city of St. Louis can collect and administer and assess their earnings taxes. Um, nothing has really happened legislatively on that front, but it is good to know that it, it continues to be a consistent, continued area of interest. And then uh, during the budget presentations to the Board of Estimate and Apportionment and um, the Budget and Public Employees Committee this year, um, the Budget Division staff did highlight that, you know, on the horizon, we still have to monitor potential economic uncertainty and the potential for sudden downturns. Um, you know, we're not seeing, you know, full-fledged signs of recession, certainly, but it's something that we continue to monitor for and looking at trends in advance. And then, um, you know, I know since we were um, asked uh, to flag um, an idea that the mayor's office um, might be interested in from, you know, the ideas portal and something independently, it was nice to see the municipal endowment fund. This is something that, um, you know, the mayor has been very interested in, and it was nice to see a few folks submit that as well. I think there was a great discussion that Christina presented on the big picture idea. So a lot of these talking points or bullet points are very, um, you know, reiterative of that. So um, it was very nice to see that. And so that was be the, um, the one item that we wanted to flag is something that's also on the mayor's radar in terms of uh, transformative long-term growth. So, and that concludes my presentation. Thank you so much, Ms. Milberg, for all of that helpful, helpful information. Um, I think it's good to see it really outlined nice and clear about uh, where we are. And also, I really like that you clarified the differences of allocated and programmed and all of that, because I think those are things that sometimes in government we assume that the public knows, but it's always nice to get that refresher and nice to see the overlap of, of interest between constituents and things that the mayor is interested in. All right. Um, and with that, I was a little early before, but um, we will now get to line item number seven, which is public engagement. Uh, so the meeting is now open for public comment on priority challenges. Uh, the procedure to provide testimony will be as follows. If you wish to speak, you want to click the raise hand emoji that should be at the bottom of your Zoom screen. This will place a raised hand next to your name. 
only people showing a raised hand will be called on to speak. There's no other way for us to know. So just make sure that you do click that. And then when I am ready for you to speak, I will let Madam Clerk know and you will be moved from the attendee list over to the panelist list, which is where you'll have to be to um, in order to give your, your comments. Um, you'll be moved back to the attendee list once you are have completed your comments and speakers from the public will be called to speak in the order of appearance on the list. Uh, committee members, um, you may have any, who have any questions after you all talk, um, we will get to you all next. And when you enter the meeting to speak, um, we will just have Madam Clerk call on your name. And then at the same time, she will go ahead and, and swear you in. And we will have to swear in each um, individual speaker as we go. And each person will have three minutes to speak and to give their comments. Um, so if you're interested in speaking, you just wanna raise your hand and then Madam Clerk, um, you can call on them and then we'll move them over and get them sworn in. And then you can, be, um, I'll let you know when you can go ahead and begin your three minutes. The first speaker I had is Justin. I'm sorry, and I didn't clarify. We just want to hear your name and then what ward you're from as well. Hello. I got to raise my hand. I remember I got this sworn in and stuff, so. Yeah. Yes, please. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this call shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Okay. I'm not sure if you heard the um, chairwoman state your name and what ward you're calling from. My name is Justin Eidelberg. I'm the mayor of the West Side, and I'm from the 10th Ward. Thank you. Your three minutes will start now. Hello, nice elected officials. Um, I appreciate y'all allowing us to have this opportunity to talk today. Um, I would like to know how and where does the economic justice plan fit into all of this and how, what, and where will it be used in this process? That's my, that's my only question. Okay, um, so today the question should be focused on what are the priorities that you would like the RAM settlement funds to be spent to meet. So maybe if you want to say, you know, you're curious about, you know, maybe you want to make some recommendations about oh, what. Oh, okay, like. then I got that for y'all too. Can we create a citywide um, Wi Fi network and partner and use that with the US Department of whatever who has this money infrastructure to help us do? a citywide and start in the most vulnerable communities deep south like Dutchtown and them other ones at 55 Marlboro, here in the West End, Hamilton Heights, places like that. How can we co-create a public school or a charter school that will be focused on pre-K through 12th grade STEM education that would help add to what I have learned from you all and uh, Greater St. Louis Inc. I think is the name when I think about the advanced manufacturing op option opportunities that will be coming. How do we help create a school that would help funnel that and to help fill the, the upcoming um, employment opportunities that for our students and other community members to have? Um, and can we turn? Can we bring a, a innovation district to the north side? I like what y'all want to do on the river. But we got that big ammunition plant on 70 and Goodfellow, and it's an old military camp base, whatever that is, on Goodfellow before you get to 70. Can we get an innovation district over here to help spur economic development? That's all I got to say, and I hope I ain't go over my time. Thank y'all. All right, can we get some community solar, too, for our most vulnerable people in partnership with Ameren and the State Department of Natural Resources? That's all I promise y'all. I ain't got nothing else. Thank y'all. Thank you, Justin. Uh, Madam Clerk, we can proceed with the next speaker. The next speaker is Matt Vitale.
Hi, right, can you hear me? I can. Okay, great. Uh, my name is Matt Vitale, and I'm from the second ward. Okay, let me swear you in. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give? And this cause will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. You have three minutes. You may proceed. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Matt Vitale. I reside in the second ward. I just want to give a little bit of story, background about why I chose to live uh, in the city of St. Louis and uh, how I think early childhood education uh, is a good priority area. Um, so about five years ago, my wife and I uh, got news that we were expecting our first child. And um, with that news, uh, we decided that we kind of needed to figure out where we wanted to live uh, long term. We were ready to buy a house. Um, and, and get a little bit bigger space for our, for our new child. Um, doing so, we were doing a lot of uh, investigation um, into just having a having child. First thing was getting our child in care. And we found out that uh, it was going to cost $1,300 a month um, for, our, for our child to be in care. Um, and, you know, our goal was to have, to have multiple children. Um, and we kind of realized, like, wow, this is a lot more expensive uh, th than we thought. Um, and some doing some investigation and deciding where we we're going to live, we recognized that uh, St. Louis public schools within the city of St. Louis had uh, free early childhood education for for all children uh, that were three to five. Um, and that was a big reason for us choosing to to move to the city. Um, and, and now uh, I have a four year old and an infant. Um, and the average I just looked this up before the call uh, that, that can up. Economic Policy Institute said that uh, for the average Missouri resident that has an infant and a four-year-old, it would cost seventeen thousand uh, dollars to have full-time care uh, for those two children, um, which is about thirty percent of the income of an average Missouri family. Um, so, with our four-year-old, um, luckily he's enrolled in St. Louis Public Schools. Um, he's it's his second year in the early child care program, and it's just been a total saving grace for us. I can't, uh, I can't overstate that fact. Um, and, and so I, I submitted um, uh, an idea to uh, use the settlement funds um, to also supplement early childhood education, because uh, for infant care, it's often the, the largest uh, cost, and there's really not a, a lot of help for families. Um, and I know at the board, you guys have recently had a few experts, I think, come to um, a few different meetings to discuss about the loss of uh, population for children in the city. And I think, uh, you know, in order to to really have some kind of uh, uh, big time change, I think we um, with the funds, I think we really need to focus on, you know, how do we get families to stay and how do we get families to come back and, and, and come to the city of St. Louis and, and keep them here in and uh, I think that's a really, a really good way forward. And I think even like with the funds, you know, we have the, the St. Louis Public Schools is the biggest provider of childhood, uh, early childhood care in the city of St. Louis. I personally think that uh, elected officials can do a better job of pushing that, getting getting people enrolled. Um, and thank you for- I'm sorry, oh. Mr. Gattel, that's time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vitale. Um, we, I believe that Ms. Milberg left the call already, but um, I will make sure that we reach out to her so that we can get that presentation sent to the clerk. Um, and then Ms. Milberg and um, Madam Comptroller, if you all are available, I'm sure members of the committee will have, um, will likely have some questions for you all. And with that, we can go to the next speaker. The next speaker is Sumik. Sumik. Looks like Narayan. <clears throat> Hello. Hi, how are you? you I'm good, how are you? Please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this call shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Okay, please state your name and what war are you uh, representing? My name is Sal McNarainen, resident of Ward 9 of Central West End. Thank you. Your three minutes will start. You may proceed. Hi. Uh, yeah, my name is Sal Mc. I'm a computer science PhD student at WashU, and my research is on using algorithms to improve the allocation of resources for humans and ethical problems. 
As part of my research, I'm currently working with the Metro Transit planning team doing data analysis to help support Metro as they work towards the upcoming 2024 Metro Transit bus network redesign. And all the numbers I'll be sharing today is coming from this work. So today I wanna to talk about one area where I want to see the city invest in with the settlement money, specifically bus infrastructure. I wanna see the city implement new infrastructure for supporting our bus network. Things like signal priority, stop consolidation and queue jumps. This infrastructure is very cheap to implement on the order of about a million dollars per mile. And it's also very non-invasive leading to virtually no political backlash. Specifically, I propose that the city use some of the settlement money to upgrade our infrastructure uh, related to our six highest ridership bus routes in the city. The in this infrastructure for these six routes would cost approximately $67 million to construct and would instantly make our buses close to 30% faster. By speeding up our bus routes, we would make much better usage of our operator hours, which is huge because operator shortages is the biggest challenge facing every transit system in the entire United States. As a result, this infrastructure would directly lead to a savings of over $7 million per year in operating expenses, meaning that the new infrastructure would directly pay for itself within a decade. Furthermore, this infrastructure would lead to an over 50% increase in transit network connectivity within the city. That means 50% more jobs, 50% more destinations reachable by transit within a certain time. And to be clear, that's a 50% increase on average for every single resident in St. Louis City. These numbers are actually higher than 50% if you look at some of our most vulnerable residents in the city, talking about people without cars, the elderly, people with disabilities, people in poverty, and more. I have a bunch more statistics that I don't have time to get into right now, but I'm happy to chat later. So to conclude, I'm proposing building trans transit infrastructure along six lines connecting and crisscrossing our entire city. This infrastructure will directly pay for itself within 10 years and lead to savings of $7 million every year going forward. This infrastructure will also lead to a 50% increase in transit access for the St. Louis, average St. Louis residents and even more for vulnerable groups. If you have any questions or wanna chat more, feel free to reach out to me. You should have my idea, my email through the ideas portal or you can reach out to my elder person, Michael Browning. He would have my contact info as well. Thank you so much for your comments and your ideas and engaging with us today. Um, Madam Clerk, we can go to the next speaker. The next speaker is Village of the Moms, STL. Hello, can you guys hear me? Hello? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. Hello, everyone. My, my name is Alicia Deal. Um, I am the board. In okay. Uh, okay. I'm sorry. Can I swear you in, please? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, I don't. Is it any way you can cut your camera on? Um, Unfortunately, no, but I can switch over to my phone if that makes a difference. Chairwoman, is that okay if the camera's not on? Yeah, we'll let you continue, but moving forward, we would like speakers to have their cameras on. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Um, I have, still have to swear you in. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give? And this cause shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Okay. Can you please state your name and what ward you're representing? Yes, my name is Alicia Deal, and I'm in ward number 11. Okay, oh, so uh, you may proceed. Okay, thank you. So, um, uh, my name is Alicia Deal, and I am a, a, a community organizer. And one of the things that, uh, in my job um, as a community organizer, I come across a lot of young mothers who are homeless. A lot of these mothers um, are either sleeping in their um, in somebody's um, house, somebody's backyard, up on the bridge, or cars, or, or all sorts of things. And what I've noticed um, in my work is that many of these young mothers are losing their baby to the state, not because they are abusive, not because they are neglected, it's because a lot of these young mothers do not have anywhere to stay. Um, many of these young mothers are under the age of 18, and so a lot of times their family put them out because they, um, for whatever reason, um, personal, maybe political, religion, however the uh, case may be. But I propose to the city if um, a lot more money be invested in, uh, of course, um, making sure that these young mothers are 
um, understanding of their rights, you know, um, whether it be their baby for adoption or to really, um, you know, I know there's a law against abortion, not that I'm promoting abortion, but these young mothers do not know their rights. Um, to um, when it comes to you know family planning and things of that sort, um, also um, put more money into um, maternal shelter because many of these young mothers are prone to being abused, and therefore their babies are subject to um, child endangerment, neglect, things of that sort. Not by not by choice, but because of the environment where they live. Um, many of the times they cannot afford uh, affordable. Uh, they can't afford a home because it's not a lot of affordable home. Many of the homes in the, in the city of St. Louis are abandoned, it's vacant. Um, and so many of these young mothers using those, uh, um, those abandoned homes to, to find short-term shelter because there's not enough shelter. And, um, and then there's more homeless people or unhoused people than it is um, people who can afford rent. Um, there are a lot of great organizations like Tabernacle Development who is trying to promote um, affordable housing, but it's, so many property, property that they have, but it's just more people that they cannot house. And so I just strongly encourage all of the all the men and all of the, all the women to really focus on really making sure that we really get these young mothers, um, dads, uh, birthing people because they are the most unhoused of them all. Um, another thing I also want to promote too is to make sure that we work with um, um, children's division because children's division are required to take those kids in when there's not enough foster homes or temporary um, protect them home and get and then guess what they are forced to go back into abusive environment, dangerous environment because there's not enough shelters or enough uh, enough agencies to take these kids in. So that's what I strongly encourage you all to think about when it comes to these young mothers and dads. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for your comments and for engaging with us today. Um, Madam Clerk, we can proceed to the next speaker. The next speaker is Carol Bradford. Yes, it's Carol Brayford. Brayford. Yeah. Ms. Brayford, would you please raise your right hand? <clears throat> Do you swear or affirm that the testimony- Oh my God, baby, baby. <laughs> Please mute your phone. Thank you. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give in this cause will, will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Your three minutes will start. Okay. I'm Carol. I'm sorry, if, you, if you can state your name and the ward that you're representing. Yes. I'm Thank Carol, you. Carol Brayford in the ninth ward. Um, so, so the idea that we posted First of all, thank you so much to all of you for all the work this is taking to actually get the public comments and participation. We've actually had a whole lot of trouble with people using the, the app and I don't understand why. Could be because of our age, I don't know. Um, but what the idea we posted is called Post Carbon Communities of Practice. I was very glad to hear an idea that, that um, talked about um, uh, the endowment fund, because our idea is similar to that in a, in a different way, but putting a smaller amount of money into our projects and letting us use it and then replenish the fund. We're calling them revolving loan funds. And all we're proposing is two $5 million loan funds that would keep being used over and over and over again. So what these communities of practice will look like is that they'll be there completely sourced by renewable sources, solar, geothermal, things that are natural resources. And we can generate those at the site in a small neighborhood development, little community. Um, we'll create, we'll do job training so that people can new, learn new skills. And then one of the features that I just love is that the people that get trained to build these communities will actually have the opportunity to become worker owners so that they'll end up owning the businesses. My husband and I don't wanna do this for the rest of our lives. We're in our seventies already. We have lots of people that wanna help us train people because people that Tom has worked in construction with for 40, 50 years are all ready to 
give it away to the younger people, train them, and let them end up owning the, the companies to build more. So the worker ownership piece is very close to my heart. What we say about these communities is that they are um, that they are places where people can live in harmony with nature and in cooperation with their neighbors. So all it's going to take is two um, loan funds. The second one will be used one to build the communities and the second one to to create the transportation that can. I'm sorry, Ms. Ms. Bradford, that's time. OK, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bradford. We do appreciate your comments and thank you for engaging with us today. Uh, Madam Clerk, we may go to the next speaker. The next speaker, Elaine. Oh, I think she took her hand down. So, uh, Malik. Hello, can you hear me? I can. Can would can I swear you in? Can you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give in this cause will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Please state your name and your award, and your three minutes will begin. My name is Malik Lindell. I live currently in Ward Eight. Um, I just was did have something planned to speak specifically on, but I feel like it's more important to speak a little generally. Um, there's a lot of great ideas in the, um, in the portal. And I think it's really important that we make sure these ideas are focused towards equity, uh, transportation and climate justice. I think all of these things really come together very well. And I think we're in a moment in St. Louis where we're seeing a lot of Unfortunately, with the bus system, it's going downhill. Currently, with the Metrolink, they're only they're mostly running single car trains. Um, the street safe street safety is a big issue. I come across issues on my bike trying to ride on the roads, and ideally, I wouldn't have to ride on um, some of these roads. But sometimes there's no option. So I really hope that we consider. Uh, like street safety as an issue, um, somehow tying in some of the things mentioned before, for instance, by Salmic um, regarding bus, prior, uh, bus signal priority. Um, so I really hope that when we're making a decision on how to spend these funds, we're looking at something that can address multiple issues at once. And it doesn't even have to just solely be for these RAM settlement funds. If we have other funds, um, I, because I think at the end of the day, as long as the issues with public transit or with street safety are addressed, um, it's going to not matter where this money comes from, right? As long as these issues are fixed. Um, and also I think it's important to highlight the, the uh, need to focus on for sort of reducing car traffic in general and the need to rely on your cars, cars cost a lot. And no one should have to be forced to pay for a car just because our city isn't designed to uh, allow people to live adequately without one. So I think that should be a goal of ours, trying to create a city where people can live without a car and um, not paying too much. Um, and one other quick note, which is more general, I think we should also make sure that we're pushing for uh, public ownership whenever possible, instead of um, just giving public funds to private entities. Um, so I do think that's another consideration when we're thinking about how we're using these funds. Let's try to make sure that whenever possible, we can use this to push for more public ownership of um, services, public services and public ownership. So that's all I have to share. Thank you so much for your comments, Malik. And I know from looking through the portal that you were a very active um, engager. So thank you for engaging us in that process as well. Um, Madam Clerk, we can go to the next speaker. Mm, Elaine, you can unmute yourself.
on mute. All right, can you can you hear me? Yes, I can. Ooh. I have to swear. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let me swear you in. Do you swear or can you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this call shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Please state your name and your ward. Elaine Smith, Laura, Ward 12, the Greater Ville, under the leadership of wonderful Sharon Tyus. I'm going to make it short but sweet. I wish that the reports had been a part of the uh, the the agenda on many of the other programs, uh, Zoom uh, meetings that I attend, the uh, notes that are given are a part of the agenda. It, uh, because I do feel rushed and uh, I did have difficulty getting on to Zoom, but the telephone did work. But uh, my middle name should be Meters, Water Meters, boom, boom, boom. I really think now is the time for the city of St. Louis to address the inaccurate, and that's what hurts me the most, the attributes that the flat rate system utilizes are inaccurate. And why the Board of Aldermen, I don't want to toss around terms like dereliction of duty, but the Board of Aldermen, have never uh, written a board bill that said new construction should have a water meter. And I am a proud member, proud, proud, proud of the American Water Association. And we had a recent big Zoom meeting on metering. And the type of meters that I've been uh, stressing throughout the portal and I know that many of you have enjoyed my my uh, writing because it's, it excites me. Uh, uh, the type of meters that I have been professing are not state of the union anymore. And I have, as I said, I'm a recent member of the American Water Association and the head of the metering department education is willing to come and speak directly. He, he sent me an email yesterday to the water enterprise <laughs> to help poor little Curtis Scobie move into the 21st century. I'm happy that I am able to uh, see my water bill online now. That was one of the things that I was pushing for, and it did happen, even though it's cumbersome to get on there, and I hope they continue to treat, tweet it. But we need water meters. Now, the $500 that was given for uh, the guaranteed income, that $5 million would cover the 90000 unmetered Residents of the city time, of St. Louis right now. Thank you. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Laura, for your comments and for your engagement with the Citizen Labs portal. Uh, Madam Clerk, we can go to the next speaker. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, I'm ready. Uh, okay. This is James Ozier. I don't need to be sure. Yes. Mr. Mr. Ozier, can, are you able to show your picture? Wait a minute. Okay. There we go. Thank All you. Right. Can you raise your right hand, please? 
Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give in this cause shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Please state your name and your award, and your three minutes will begin. Uh, Jay Ozier, and I'm in the uh, 13th Ward. And it, uh, uh, I was going to understand this is the committee of a whole of the Board of Aldermen. Uh, that's what I saw up on the screen. But I, uh, with these uh, types of funds that uh, was mentioned, two types, uh, I think it's very important that we see in terms of opportunities to help increase uh, uh, employment and good paying jobs in the city of St. Louis. And so I think that should be an underlying occurring uh, throughout, you know, them both pots of uh, funds or, or any other funds for that matter. The other uh, thing is that the St. Louis public schools, uh, the city needs to work with the St. Louis public schools in order to uh, create a pre-apprenticeship program. Many of the um, uh, building trades have expressed that they've uh, had some difficulty in terms of trying to push that uh, within the uh, public schools. So I think it will be important if the uh, Board of Aldermen, uh, you know, get on board and also to um, um, you know, create uh, 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 these pre-apprenticeship programs. So once young people are out of uh, high school, that they can get into one of these building trades and they can, they can make a career. And, uh, and make some good money that has good benefits and uh, hopefully to be able to keep them uh, in the city of St. Louis. Uh, I may have missed when you were speaking, uh, uh, the, the mayor's office was speaking earlier. Uh, uh, I didn't hear anything in terms of, of um, uh, how to uh, raise the uh, 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 wages in this uh, for public employees. I know the board of aldermen would have to eventually do it, but that needs to be. If you're going to try to fill them s s positions, you're going to have to raise the pay. Uh, it's just simple as that. And if, if what I don't know the procedure that you need to do, but you do need to do it. And I'm saying specifically more with the correction officers in the city of St. Louis. You're not going to get people to take on that responsibility and and, and that abuse and so forth without uh, uh, some, some real conversation uh, for them and some assistance for them to deal with some of the issues that they will have because there will be some issues they would have coming home from work. But uh, and also in terms of what is being done to make the the facility. Mr. Ozier, uh, I'm sorry, that's yes. time. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Ozier, for your time. And also a, a little side history note is that you were alderman in the 1990s of the 22nd Ward. So I also wanted to thank you for your service to our city and thank you for engaging with us today. Um, well, thank you. You're welcome. And with that, Madam Clerk, we may go to the next speaker. Um, the next speaker is, uh, looks like from a cell phone, maybe, Joy Tab. I do not see them at the moment. You can go to the next speaker, Madam Clerk. The next speaker is Sam. Hello. Hi. Uh, I need to swear you in. You raise your right hand. 
Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this call shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Can you please state your name and your award? And your three minutes will begin. Okay. I am Samantha Miner. Um, I reside in Ward 7. Um, so kind of piggybacking off what, what Mr. Ozier said, thinking about some of the organizations that are already doing these career pathway, um, like apprenticeships, or they're attempting to. I am all for advocating that all, not all students need to go to college. So knowing that there are organizations that are already building these programs, but they're having a tougher time getting into some of the apprenticeship programs or getting connections, would the city be willing to partner with them to make it much smoother? The process is already happening. The schools are already invested. It's just a matter of making sure that the apprenticeships are available and the preparation for our students. I know that there have been some apprenticeship programs where there may be work keys and things involved and then going to student education, our students aren't necessarily prepared for it. And then there's also their interests. I know a lot of times we wanna start at high school to do these apprenticeship programs and think about the interest that they bring. I oh, know it looks like we lost you, Ms. Miner. Yeah, it looks like we lost you. I'll come back to her as soon as I see her, if that's okay with you. Yes. Yes, that's fine. That Sam. The next speaker is a Anita. No, I'm sorry. Joy tab two. Like the color from my Joy tab two. If not, we can move on. Okay, so we'll go on to the next speaker. The next speaker is Anita. Um, I'm sorry about that. I'm um, sorry. M Madam Chair, is it okay if she, uh, Ms. Minor, continues? Yes, please. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so, as I was saying, there are programs that are being developed. And I think that if the city were to connect, it would strengthen the liability of these programs and introducing the interest of these programs with middle school students. How can they know what they're interested in if we wait until high school? Sometimes we lose that engagement and then we have to refight for it. Um, I also want to advocate for a space for schools to take their students. So like a STEM lab, not every school has a STEM lab within it. So is there a designated space where we can build out an innovation center like what was mentioned earlier? I am all for opportunities like that to not only provide for the students, but a place for the community to go on the weekends. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Miner, for your comments and for engaging with us today. I always love to see you. <laughs> All right. And with that, Madam Clerk, we can go to the next speaker. The next speaker. I'm sorry. The next speaker is uh, Paula. Hi, how are you? I have to swear you in. Can you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this call shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Please state your name and your ward, and your <laughs> we'll begin. Paula Vickers, and it's Ward 12. And then I um, submitted the idea for investing into child care, and I want to um, really just highlight that as an opportunity for us to address several issues as someone said, to address several issues by looking at this one. Um, so childcare has the greatest return on investment when we're looking at public safety, when we're looking at the Are development you, of- Can you hear me, Ms. Carla? I think we've got to get you sworn in. Me? What's happening? 
we we did already all the women. Sorry, it cut off on my end. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, but I think that by investing in childcare, we can really address several issues for St. Louis in one. Um, childcare and early childhood development has the greatest return on investment when we're looking at public safety, when we're looking at the careers and the opportunities that the people that are growing up in St. Louis will uh, contribute to St. Louis later. So I think someone, uh, you want to talk to? Someone recommended investing um, like in safe, but the greatest investment is investing in the children. Um, but the other part of that is like St. Louis could be a really great place to attract families. St. Louis is one of the only places that has a free zoo, a free children's music, or a free science center, um, all these great things where we can bring people back to St. Louis. And that's going to overall improve St. Louis as a whole. But the other part of that is we have to look at supporting early child care workforce. Um, because we're talking about raising wages, but so many of these child care providers work for minimum wage and they're not going to keep taking care of our children when they can't provide for their own children. Um, so if we want our workforce to continue in St. Louis, if we want St. Louis to continue to thrive, if we want these children to not grow up to be teenagers that tear up our city, we need to start investing now. Thank you. How are you barking? Thank you, Ms. Pablo, for your comments today and engaging with us. And with that, Madam Clerk, we can go to the next speaker. Orky, R-O-R-K-E. Hi, I'm here. I'm just trying to get my camera to work. Can you hear me? I can. Okay, great. Okay. Um, you say you're unable to get your camera to work? Yeah, for some reason, I think my video isn't, let's see here, isn't big, uh, finding out my camera where it is. Let me see if I can change the settings. Hold up, here we are. Okay. Hello. Hi, I have to swear you in. Can you raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this call should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you. Please state your name and the ward that you live in. Yeah, uh, I'm Rourke Chuk, Ward 1. You may begin. You're, you have three minutes. Yeah, so I wanted to jump in to give my perspective. I've had a career um, trying, trying to link individuals to resources all throughout the city, uh, whether it's in mental health or in education. And the work, the folks I work with are often either in crisis, they're unhoused, or living with mental or behavioral issues or in financial stress. But it's, often, it's not just those folks um, in crisis. It's also, it's also students, older adults, and people who just need to go to the doctor or the grocery store. And when I ask them what resources they most need, they usually give me one of two answers. It's either transportation or housing. 99% of the time, that's what they need. Um, and so I really want to push um, and uh, yeah, push the idea and push the uh, priority to focus on transportation as well as housing. Uh, for instance, transportation, so the folks I work with often need it, and need it for like, you know, picking up or delivering their kids from childcare, getting to, to work, being able to get a job at all. And then in terms of housing, um, oh, so let me go back a little bit. Yeah, let me continue, sorry. And so, and also, also the bus system that we have now, it's really difficult to live and thrive in St. Louis with the types of services we get. There's not much you can do for stability when you have to wait like 45 minutes or more for the bus if it comes, sometimes and often it's late or the schedule isn't right. And so I feel that in order to give all sorts of stuff to people stability in their lives and ability to thrive and live fully in St. Louis, transportation is a big one. Again, sometimes it's 
older elderly people who need to go to the doctor or want to visit their relatives, or sometimes it's students who are trying to skin around the city. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to talk about is housing, because again, that's another big thing that helps provide stability for many different types of people. Um, housing doesn't just offer you know, a roof over your head, it offers an address where people can get their benefits mailed to or their paychecks mailed to, or just the place that they can write on their job application under that address, address section. And so focusing on these two things, I think would do would um would really lift up all sorts of folks. Um, and so investing in transportation, prioritizing competitive salaries for bus operators, um, prioritizing public housing, dense housing, um, yeah, would really increase the quality of life. And I just wanted to speak on behalf and advocate for the folks that I work with that. Oftentimes, when they call me and ask for things, I have nothing to offer them because St. Louis has nothing to Thank offer you, many people. That's time. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Ms. Bork. Um, with that, Madam Clerk, we can go to the next speaker. The next speaker is Parm. Are you able to un, uh, unmute your camera or show your picture, please? We'll go to the next one. The next speaker, Will. Will? Yes, do you hear me? I can. Thank oh, you very much. Great. I have to swear you in. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this cause shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you. Please state your name and your award, and your three minutes will begin. Yes, um, my name is Will Andrews, and I am in the seventh ward. And first, I just want to thank you all for hosting this. And I love living in St. Louis. It's a great place. And I've only lived in my ward for two years. But some ideas that I have, and I think they're pretty simple, so I'm not going to take up everyone's time. But I would like to see some of the funds be used to help improve sidewalks. Um, not just only in my ward, but all the wards, because this is a beautiful city to walk around. And, you know, if individuals are out walking, they're exercising, it's bettering our health. But there, I feel like the city, there's a lot of neglected sidewalks that make it inedible, uh, not easy for individuals to navig navigate or walk to the grocery store or areas without slipping or hurting themselves. The other part was around some of the city roads, the potholes. I'm seeing the city do good things by filling them, but I feel like there's a lot in the neighborhood areas that really need to be regrind and repaid to make it more safer for um, people's cars, um, being able to go, you know, go back and forth to work. The other area that I suggestions that I would like to see is I see way too many people speeding in the city, especially in the neighborhood roads. So I think if there were speed bumps or roundabouts that would help prevent people from speeding. Um, and, you know, the, in my neighborhood itself, there's a lot of kids that play in these streets and you have cars playing loud music and just going more than the average speed limit should be. So those are my ideas. Thank you all again. I really do appreciate it. And 
um, that's all I have to share. Thank you. Thank you, Will, for coming and joining us today and taking the time to engage with us. <laughs> I can relate to all of St. Louis City with the damage to the car and the need for better roads and infrastructure. So thank you for that. And with that, Madam Clerk, we can go to the next speaker. Um, we're going to go back to Joy, tab two. Joy, tab two. Maybe they're having issues. Okay. Oh, oh, there he is. Okay. I'm about to swear you in. Can you please raise your right hand? Oh. No, I'm Walker. Okay, I'm it, that's what it says on the screen. Oh, I'm Curtis Walker. Okay, okay. Well, that's who I'm talking about you. It, that's what it has on the screen, sir. So if you can oh, okay. just, let me swear you in, and then you can give your name and your award. Do oh, you God. swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this call shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Okay, thank you very much. Please state your name and the award, and your three minutes will begin. Okay, my name is Curtis Walker, and uh, I'm in Ward 12. And I'm representing all the wars. And uh, I have a, a nonprofit, 501c3 Foundation, and uh, it's called Community United Foundation. And I'm seeking the funds to, there's uh, like 18, there's 18 uh, vacant schools in the community. There's 18 vacant schools in the community, plus this community is vacant. And I think the money would be good for building homes. We can get the kids that's in juvenile, I mean, not in juvenile, in uh, Job Corps, the kids that's in uh, Rankin Tech to build these homes in our community, uh, fix up the vacant schools for the kids to attend the schools after school to help with they but they um they work get the kids from the university uh Harrisville State University the teachers to come in and help the kids with their homework after school a uh, place for you take the kids every day all day for for um babysitting you say your 13 year old daughter can uh watch kids babysit she can watch kids and babysit in the, in the foundation you can babysit in the uh, foundation. Did I lose y'all? Hello? We can still hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, but I say, I say, okay. You know, it's like 18 different schools in the community, which all over the community. And uh, the community need homes in. So get the kids that's in the job core, fix these vacant schools up, for the kids to attend the schools after school, the teachers from Harris State University come in and get their credits for helping the kids with their homework daily for one to three hours, uh, pay for the kids to, to be there and play. I'm gonna have everything in there that will bring the kids attention there to keep them there and focus, play a few games, Play your games, take a few minutes, go over there and get your homework done and things like that. A place for you, these up and coming police officers, they can come in there and get to know the children's inside the Community United Foundation as a whole. These people's out there you see on the street begging for this, that, another got a job for them. They can help clean up the city. The people that's, these guys that's out here got these hands on training, know how to build and do this, that, and other. Got a job for them all. Won't nobody get paid that much because it's just a community effort. And it can last long. And then people will be able to, people will be able to, um, I'm getting a little fast. People will be able to have their children down there. Thank you, Mr. Walker. That's time. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Walker, for bringing your comments today and engaging with us. And with that, Madam Clerk, we can go to the next speaker. 
the next speaker is Linda. And I have to swear you in. Okay. You can thank you. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this call shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Please state your name and your ward, and your three minutes will begin. Linda Braboy, Ward 9. Um, I was wanting to focus on uh, the unhoused. Um, I see unhoused all around the city of St. Louis. As you all have know, it's been in the news quite often. And earlier today, I made a comment, I believe it was on the uh, Citizens Lab portal um, about the unhoused, what have you in the area. Um, but I was kind of like thinking of something maybe kind of piggyback off of the International Institute of St. Louis. They have a refugee resettlement program. And maybe it can be something of the nature of a residential resettlement program for the unhoused. It will have to be um, uh, very like just managed to the T on like housing, mental behavior, substance abuse and employment. And it have to all be collaborating and work to, together, not like individual programs but all together. Um, it is going to be cost a quite extensive amount of money, maybe more than what you all can provide, but it's a start um, because everyone in the city of St. Louis or everywhere, if they want a home, they deserve a home, especially if they want one. And I'm saying based off the refugee um, uh, resettlement program, because I don't have anything, I'm not biased at all, I don't have anything against refugees, and I think you should help refugees just as well as help everyone else. Um, that's here in the city of St. Louis. Um, but to me, it's kind of it's kind of asinine that um, in the city of St. Louis, you can come in or in the United States as a refugee and you have a warm, clean, safe place to lay your head when you come in as a refugee. But you're a citizen of the United States and you've been here for years and you're homeless, you know, with your family, with your husband and your kids or what have you. And you're still on the streets day after day as a lucky thing or blessing if you have a tent to even put up under the city of St. Louis how, uh, window for what a mayor uh, works at to even live in, you know, and it, it doesn't make any sense, you know, it's need to be more funding some type of way to focus on the unhoused, uh, because if you fix the unhoused, you know, if you help the unhoused, you're helping the city of St. Louis, you know, you're helping the community, you know, as a whole. And it's just unfair to me for um, uh, children, you know, uh, or I think of a lot of times the pregnant lady that was in the, in the news uh, back here a couple of weeks, you know, and with myself, I'm housed right now, but you never know. I'm having issues with my apartment with the St. Louis Housing Authority have been for a month, for a year, for about a year or more. And I'm not even sure if I'm going to be one unhoused at the end of this month. Um, so... Um, and it's not a, it's a, a control that's out of my own, you know, it wasn't in my control. So a lot of the people that's homeless or on housing, or however they call them, they don't want to be there, a lot of them. Thank you, Miss Linda. That's mm -hmm. time. Thank you, Miss Linda, for engaging with us and for your comments today and your compassion. Mm -hmm. um, with that, Madam Clerk, we can go to the next speaker. The next speaker is Laura. Uh, Laura Lucas. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I thought I had my video on until just now when I saw the whole screen and it's not coming on. And normally I. Do you see a little icon that says start video at the bottom next start... to your button? What do I want to click on? Easy can start video button next to the mute button. It should yeah. say start video. I see that, but it says easy camera. Or video settings. Mm -hmm. Easy camera is checked, but it's not coming on. We'll come back to you. Okay, to you. that's fine. That's fine. The next speaker is Ryan. Ryan Filling.
Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me? I can. All right. See me too? I cannot. All right. Well. It, are you in dark? It, it looks like your camera may be on, but you're just in a very dark setting. Um. No, I got my camera on. I'm, I'm sorry. I don't know what's going on. I had that's to borrow good. a computer. Um, that's okay. We'll go to the next speaker and revisit and see if you've worked that out. All right. Thank you. The next speaker is Anthony Wales. Last name Wales, Anthony. Okay. Sorry. Hello. Hi, how are you? I'm doing pretty good. That's good. Uh, can I swear you in, please? Yes. Raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this call shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you. Please state your name and what ward you live in. Thank you. And your three minutes will begin. Anthony Wells, 13th Ward. Uh, one of the key things I would like to bring up with the funds that are available is the LRA housing. Um, there seems to be a current problem, not just in St. Louis, but in the United States of America, that uh, housing is a big issue. And there is a substantial amount of housing that can be used in St. Louis. Um, from people that I've talked to, for some reason, it seems that the biggest issue with LRA may be the red tape as far as getting different certificates or different licensing to do certain construction. Uh, that's just some of the issues that I've heard. Um, to be more exact on why this is such a key issue, uh, I believe it's it's an important thing. It's an important step. It's an important direction to go to in the city of St. Louis. Um, population numbers may be decreasing at a rate that cannot be sustainable for a city. So the biggest issue would be is to bring the population back up. And I think one of those key things that could bring the population back up is loosening the boundaries of LRA to have a greater community and people that want to build in the community. People may not know that a sheet of drywall may cost $10. Um, so there has to be education on what you can actually do in the house. That that turn can turn to the public schools, which can also go to different job programs that are work within the city. So loosening the, the boundaries of LRA, I think, will create a, a big beacon and great growth in the city and on the city. And I think it just has to be an issue that really, really needs a large undertaking because the, the population of the city has to be increased, especially on the north side and the west side. You have to make it more attractive. You have to make it more attractive. We can start with cheap housing with how some of the LRA houses are priced right now. And that's just pretty much all I have to say about that right now. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Wells. And with that, Madam Clerk, we can go to the next speaker. The next speaker is Marshall Woodland. Yes. And if if, if my if my picture showed up, I, I can uh, get my camera. Okay. Okay. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Can I swear you in, please? Yes, ma'am. You can raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this call shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you. Please state your name and, and your award. Uh, my name is Marshall Woodland. I, I mostly reside in seven, but because I have been a person had that has experienced homelessness, I have bounced around, but seven forward. Thank you. You may begin. 
Okay, I basically want to start off by asking a question that I would like for everyone listening or watching. Uh, you don't have to answer the question, but just think about it. The, what was the main reason for the Rams uh, lawsuit? The answer that I would like to say is because the taxpayers paid to have the dome built so that we could have a professional NFL team. Because that contract was, um, because they walked away from that contract and leaving the city with a huge debt, we have now a stadium which is not used enough. 365 days of a year, this venue could be used for doing community fundraisers for so many of our issues, especially for uh, the homeless problem. And because we have so many homeless people that are not being counted, that are living in not just shelters, but living with others, living in extended stays, uh, cheap hotels, motels. I mean, I can attest to so many of that, of those uh, situations. I did submit my idea, and I have been in the community for over 15 years, close to 20 years, um, asking the community to consider joining a team of people to help organize these type of events. Uh, I've already uh, started the process of one of the events that I did submit to the portal. I'm looking for an opportunity to partner with the city so that we the people can come together and create community fundraisers to support so many issues that we are facing. So I, again, I'd like to ask that question. Why did the lawsuit come about? And for those who want to answer the question, please consider checking out my idea that I submitted for using the, the uh, dome and any other venue, streets or parks that the citizens are paying for to have community fundraisers. And I'll leave with that. Thank you. All right, thank you for your comments, Ms. Woodland. And it looks like Ms. Lucas may have figured out her camera. Hello. How are you? Fine. Can I, I will have to swear you in. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this call shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Please state your name and your award, and you have three minutes. Laura Lucas, Ward 1. I did meet Ms. Schweitzer last month at a Carondelet meeting. I've only lived in this area for two years, came from Oklahoma, and I am currently renting an apartment at the Fountains of Carondelet. When I moved here, I did not know the history of the apartment. And this is for me, it's only the second time in my adult life I've had to live in an apartment. And I am just astounded at the inside of many of the ones that I see, the work I had to do in my own apartment to make it livable. Um, I don't know the laws here regarding ownership what a person is required to provide an apartment condition-wise, but I'm seeing an awful lot of slumlord places, not only here, but in other parts of St. Louis, I see a lot of slumlord rentals. So uh, yet they expect full rent, even when the apartments are not livable. Part of my um, request to you as part of the use of the funds is that you would, part of the reason I know of people have to stay here even in the condition it's in is they don't have a first month's rent, last month's rent and deposit to let them move. So if part of the funds could be giving people who are in a place that is in slum condition, let them find a place they want to move to, they will continue paying the rent, but these funds would help them with first month rent, last month rent, and deposit so that they could move and get into decent housing that would uplift their spirits and their working and living conditions, giving them a better home. And it would 
kick the butt of the ownerships and make them do something if they want tenants. So, and I think that the rights of both the tenants and the owners should be published somewhere. If it is, I don't know about it and I need to know about it because I would like to know what the rights are of both the tenants and the owners. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lucas, for your comments and engaging with us today. I'm glad you were able to work out your camera. You're welcome. And with that, Madam Clerk, we can go to the next speaker. Um, I do want to just remind folks that your each individual gets three minutes to comment, and we won't be doing multiple comments this evening. Our next speaker is Lauren Williams. Houston, come in. Can y'all hear and see me? Yes. Yes. Okay. I need to swear you in. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this call shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. State your name and what ward you're calling from. My name is Laren Williams, Seventh Ward. Um, the proposal that I submitted and one of the ideas that I think would um would take St. Louis by storm is uh, something that I dubbed game banging. I did a pilot project in 2018 where I took four young girls that I had found uh, essentially in a hostile environment. I created a an environment for those girls to uh, do team building exercises. And one of the most pertinent outcomes was having other persons that those girls were involved with also later on wanting to uh, become a part of that. These were troubled teens um, of the age group that I've heard persons concerned earlier in these sorts of talks uh, about like tearing up the city and stuff. So these troubled teens um, were the face of a large number of young people throughout the city of St. Louis who have been at some time in their lives uh, uh, possibly had run-ins with the law. The reason I think my idea is pertinent is because, for one, um, this settlement money, as Ms. Woodland uh, stated, came behind um, the Rams walking away from St. Louis out of a contract. Uh, uh, something else that has come up to me in my research is St. Louis, is, St. Louis being a strategic hub um, during wartime. Um, the third thing is that out of game banging, we have an opportunity to allow these young kids to increase their social status with one another. And at the same time, while watching, while viewers watch them do this, those two will be excited about uh, possibly partaking in such a uh, social program. Um, I did also mention in the proposal that other industries that may later be interested in something like this going on would possibly be the United States government because as it is right now, we have, I think my telephone just went off. Can you guys still hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, one of the other things I'm trying to not bounce all over the place, but one of the other things I addressed was like the industries of um, artificial intelligence, being able to take the data generated from um, this social program and use it to train advanced um, algorithms, things that are uh, currently known as large language models. Um, St. Louis right now has been recognized a long time for its longstanding franchise, the St. Louis Cardinals. Esports is something that is recognized throughout the country. And I think St. Louis being in the center of the country has an opportunity to start putting a lot of these teams in a sports position that is now recognized and St. Louis being one of the first states or and or Thank cities. Thank you, Mr. Williams. That's time. Yes. yes. Thank you, Mr. Williams, for your comments and coming to engage us today and making sure that you submitted that idea to the portal. And then with that, Madam Clerk, we can go to the next speaker. Um, uh, Dominique had their hand up, but I don't see their hand up anymore. And uh, Cheryl. Okay, this person did too. 
Poem. E A A R M. <clears throat> Ms. Carm, are you able to cut your camera on? Uh, wait a minute. It should be on. Start video. There we go. Okay. Okay. Um, let me swear you in, please. Do you swear or affirm, King Ray? Thank you. King, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this cause shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you. Please state your name and your award, and you have three minutes. Um, my name is Patricia Armstrong. I'm in Ward 9. And Michael, if you're still there, I appreciate your quickness and getting back on email. Um, somebody a few people back mentioned repairing sidewalks. And I have personal experience with the problems with broken and uneven sidewalks. I walk with a rollator and I have talked to several people that are going up and down the streets in their motorized wheelchairs or their motorized scooters as to why they're in the street and not the sidewalk. And they've told me the streets are too, un the sidewalks are too uneven. I try to stay on the sidewalks because I, I get out and walk my dog and she needs the verge to go potty. And if we're in the street, it's not as handy to her. But I have fallen twice in the past year due to uneven pavement. And I have barked my shins or my knees on parts of my rollator hard enough to cause bleeding because of uneven pavements. You know, that old rule of physics, uh, body in motion tends to stay in motion. Well, the rollator stopped and I didn't. I think that this is really dangerous for people like me who need aids to walk and for people in wheelchairs who can't get up over these bumps in the pavement or can't get out of the holes in the pavement so they must stay in the streets. Luckily, this area is rather low traffic, but Sarah and Washington are not necessarily low traffic and People are still in the streets on these apparatuses. That's all I wanted to say. If something could slip some of this in or perhaps a site where people could mention exactly where the problems are the worst so that you didn't have to send somebody out to examine all of the pavement because that would really be a waste of time. Most of it's in fairly good shape. But a site where people could report exactly where the pavement is impeding their abilities to travel when they're on wheels of any kind. That's it. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your time, Parm, and your comments today. Um, Madam Clerk, can you just confirm that that was our last speaker? No, we do have Ryan. Okay. Perfect. Camera is working. Again. It's um is my audio working again? We, yes, we can hear you. Yeah, we it says the host has stopped my video. Oh. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, is it okay if he just proceed? Uh is that this is the last speaker? We had Cheryl. Yeah. And you got it on now, so that's great. Okay. Uh Cheryl, but her hand is no longer up, so it's, we'll, I'll call for it, but that was the last person. I'm sorry, uh, Ryan, that, thank you very much. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this call shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, ma'am. Please state your name and your award, and you have three minutes. You may proceed. My name is Ryan Felling, and I am in Ward 1. Um, just listen to everybody. If the focus of this entire funding is for generational change. I'm curious 
and this is really to the board or who's going to be allocating and making the decisions is how are we going to decide the, I guess, effectiveness in terms of a lot of these things sound like they're going to need either continual funding if they're going to be transformational or they already fall under what I would think is a department and should be getting recurring funding from the tax base. So if there's going to be a parsing of ideas at some point of what is really just a wish list of what people would like already from their government and what they should be funding and doing, and then also where's the transformation. Um, Cause maybe like cost of childcare is, could we be hiring grant writers to get grant money from the federal government that's out there and fund those projects and then still hold on to our Rams money and use it for things in the future? Because when I hear generational changes, what's a generation, 10, 20, 30, 40 years? We have $250 million. If we spend it all up front. Where, where's the maintenance? Where's the recurring funding? Where's the next problem to address down the road? Um, so that's really more of my concerns, not maybe necessarily an idea, but when we're discerning over which ideas are valid, is it valid for this funding? Because I just heard we still have 50% of our ARPA funds. And if those are for infrastructure projects, um, there's infrastructure projects for water, which we just raised, um, our bills for which I'm fine. It should be it should be paid out of that, but is that RAM settlement money? So going down the road, when people say, "Hey, I really like this idea," is that a I like this idea because it's a good idea, or do I like this idea for generational change under the RAM settlement? And who's going to decide that and how? And that's what I'm really curious about. And I'll see you the rest of my time. Thank you for your your comments and your questions, Mr. Falling. And Madam Clark, do we have one more? Cheryl, if she's on, she's the last speaker. Cheryl. Oh, there we go. You're on mute. Can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear All me? Right. Um, can I swear you in, please? Where yes, ma'am. Thank you. And do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this cause shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you. Please state your name and your award, and you have three minutes. Okay. Uh, my name is Cheryl Wittenauer, and I live in the Sixth Ward, Tower Grove South. Um, uh, I submitted a couple ideas. The one I wanted to speak on just briefly now is um, what I see as a real need for um, support of um, animals uh, in the city, um, and specifically that are under the care of Care STL, which has the contract with the city of St. Louis to care for um, uh, our stray animals. Uh, they desperately need um, monies for a new shelter or they need a new shelter facility. The shelter facility they have right now off of uh, Jefferson Avenue at Walnut uh, doesn't even have a sign out so that people don't even know that it exists in case they were in the mood for adopting a dog, uh, an animal, a pet. Um, but it, it's so small um, that uh, they have to house animals in crates outside. Um, in the heat and in the winter um, because they're just so short of space. And animal control is bringing animals in. Um, they, they just get some adopted and they get three times as many in the next night. And this is part of a national problem as you're probably all aware. Um, there's a whole lot of reasons, you know, backyard breeding, lack of spay and neutering services and evictions. Everybody adopted a pet during COVID and then everybody gave up their pet um, or surrendering animals um, now. So just in brief, um, CARE STL really needs our support. Uh, their staff are overwhelmed. Their space is very, very small uh, and cannot accommodate the number of animals they're getting. Uh, they need 
they need funds or the city needs funds for spay and neuter services. Um, they're begging their supporters on Facebook to contribute to spay and neuter and also for surgical services. They're just very underfunded. Um, this is not to say that all the human needs in the city aren't great. They are. And I, and I fully appreciate that, but I just wanted to give a voice to the animals as well. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. Cheryl, for your comments today and for your um, compassion. Um, and with that, I think we have completed all of our public comments. So we will go to line item number eight. Um, I will go through members of the committee. And if you all have any questions or any comments, Ms. Milberg from um, the mayor's office, the policy director is here if you guys have any questions. And of course, Ms. Garmendi is here as well. So you can ask questions, you can make general comments, whatever you'd like to do. And I am going to go in order of seniority. So I, um, I'm just gonna call it off and I don't, I'll start with Alderman Cohn. Thank you, Madam Chair. I don't have any questions at this time or comments. I appreciate everyone's time this evening. Thank you for joining us, Alderman Cohn. Alderwoman Tyus. All right, Alderwoman Spencer. Alderwoman Boyd. Alderman Oldenburg is not here. Alderman Orion. Alderwoman Clark Hubbard. Thank you. I don't have any questions at this time. I would like to um, show appreciation for everyone who took the time out um, to engage. Everyone knows how much I love to see our public engaged in these committees and these committee hearings. And absolutely, I um, will be taking in back to the information that uh, was shared by our comptroller and the mayor's office and then be able to probably have some questions. Um, to follow up on. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alderwoman Schweitzer. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone who took the time to speak today. I took a lot of notes about the things people were saying and uh, the comments people were making. Some of the ones that stood out to me is really hammering home the generational change, thinking about what the city of St. Louis will look like in the future, whether we're thinking about our population, whether we're thinking about climate, whether we're thinking about infrastructure, roads, how we get to and from work. All of these things are really important questions to be, to be thinking about. So I really appreciate people who lifted up those sorts of things. Um, and I appreciate the presentations from the mayor's office, president's office, and the comptroller. Uh, it was really a lot to learn and, and take stock of. Uh, you know, I still think that the um, survey results would have been a little bit different, had more city services and more questions about things that people expect to get from their city it had been asked. And so I did see that the streets and public safety did rise to the top of a lot of, a lot of the surveys people came in and I would have really been interested in seeing what people would have said about, you know, I experienced my trash not getting picked up or I experienced um, my tree limbs hanging from the, from the trees or I experienced a lot of different things that the city should be providing. So uh, I appreciate um, the opportunity that there was to have a write in. And of course, I appreciate the people who spoke about water infrastructure and other infrastructure needs. Uh, thanks for the time. Thanks to everyone who came. Thank you, Alderwoman Schweitzer. Alderwoman Keys. Alderwoman Velasquez. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to echo thanks to all the presenters for tonight and um, all the people who came out for public comment. Um, I do think that there were some, I would like to get copies of some of these things that are presented. And I think, you know, there's some questions to follow up with, uh, with the mayor's office and the comptroller as well, but just happy that we're getting uh, a lot of this in front of people and people are eager to share their ideas. Thank you, Alderwoman Velasquez. Alderman Browning. I uh, just want to echo my colleagues' comments. Thank you to everybody who came out tonight. It was good to see several people from the Ninth Ward testify. Lots of really good ideas. Uh, just want to emphasize again the idea of generational change. Uh, there's a lot of things that our city does not do well right now, and we do have an opportunity to correct that. 
Um, I, I, I appreciate a lot of the really grounded ideas I heard tonight addressing some of those issues that our city is facing. Sidewalks being a big one. Uh, that's a disability justice issue. Uh, we need to address water infrastructure. That affects all of us. Uh, so it's really good to hear a lot of that. And um, I just that this whole session tonight was extremely educational. And so I thank everyone for participating in it. Thank you. Alderman Aldrich. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for uh, uh, leading us today. Uh, very good. Also echo a lot. Other things that my colleague said, I do want to thank uh, Christina Gramendia from the present office for a wonderful presentation that uh, provided a lot of data. Also want to thank uh, the present staff um, who uh, took the time to put a lot of this, uh, a lot of those paper surveys, uh, which last meeting I know we talked about uh, ensuring that, you know, we try to touch as many people as possible. Understanding that the old generation or, or people in the northern part of the city may not have access to it. So thank them for uh, actively putting those in so that that could be part of the data as well as the organizations that took the time to knock the door to make sure that we uplifted uh, people voices who, again, then have access to Internet. Also, thank the comptroller um, for her presentation and really raising the concern. Uh, about the ARPA funds, understanding that we have a little bit more time with Rams uh, money, but uh, we need to get the ARPA funds out the door uh, and a little less than half have actually been put out the door. Also, I want to thank uh, Casey Milbert from the uh, mayor's office for doing a breakdown a little bit of where some of those ARPA dollars uh, have went to, um, as well as every person that uh, did the survey that signed up today that's been uh, with us in a long evening meeting. Heard a lot of great ideas, uh, like my colleague said, you know, um, some from participants such as like just citywide Wi Fi, uh, early childhood, bus transit, um, infrastructure. I think that is a key one that continues to be uh, talked about, uh, not just in this meeting, but I think in general, a lot of us get that as all the people how to actually upgrade the infrastructure of the city of St. Louis, housing, uh, speeding and sidewalks. How do we uh, continue to, again, upgrade our infrastructure as well as what can we do with maybe some of these funds to help our unhoused community? Um, so uh, I'll leave it at that. I look forward to uh, these ongoing conversations. And I, again, I want to appreciate everyone for being here. I also want to appreciate the Board of Alderman staff, uh, Madam Clerk, as well as uh, Ms. Tracy, who was very helpful today and to this process and STLT. Thank you, Alderman Aldridge. And I almost said last but not least, but this time I remembered that President Green will be our last but not least before myself. Madam Green. Uh, thank you. Um, and I want to thank all the public that came out. Um, you know, part of this process, we're casting a wide net at start and we'll, you know, throughout this process, we'll be able to whittle things down and I think get to uh, kind of get through the feasibility of, of a lot of these ideas that are rising to uh, the top and how expensive things are and, um, and, and, you know, whether we can create some kind of municipal endowment that that funds some of these things on an ongoing basis. Um, if Miss Millbrook is here, I do have a couple of maybe questions or, or requests, I think, for the next meeting. Um, trying to see if she's here. Who was dialed in earlier? Okay. Um, cause there's a, there's a few things going forward that I, uh, I think it would, um, be beneficial to us to have some of this information. I think we, you know, we saw from the survey results that 911 kind of continues to rise to the top. And we know that there's been some pretty significant investments in 911. We know that, um, there's been some, some work in increasing staffing with 911. And I think it would be a really good update to kind of learn um what if there's still a funding gap knowing that the the governor vetoed the i think 13 million dollars that was supposed to go to psap so is there um is there a gap there how are we looking to fill it um i i think it would also be beneficial to learn a little bit more about um out you know about a year ago we funded i think 40 million dollars in street paving so to understand kind of where we are in that and how much 
um, we think is outstanding in terms of uh, uh, how much is outstanding in, in terms of um, what street paving we need versus what we have allocated funds for. And uh, and then I think the last thing, um, given sort of the ARPA updates tonight, is we know that there are many things that we allocated uh, ARPA dollars to that um, in it, like may run out at the end of the at the end of 2026. And so I think it would also be good for us to look at, you know, are there things that we saw as priorities that we gave initial, you know, seed money or startup money to um to get us to 2026 that we need to be looking now beyond that and how we continue funding uh for some of those things after those ARPA dollars are all expended. Um so yeah, I think Casey's on, but it says can we unmute it. Is it? Can we? Yeah, I don't know if it. Can you yeah. hear me? Yes, now I can. can you hear me? I'm in like a red X over over here. Oh. But, so yes, I can hear you now. That's extremely exciting for all parties involved. Happy we crossed that hurdle. Um, sure. So let me, um, I can get back to folks with information on street paving. That's more on the operations side of things. So happy to pull some information on that for sure. And then um, I know that we'll, we're looking to do a, um, yeah, like an ARPA by uh, spend uh, status report uh, hearing to the board here pretty soon. So we can um, target some of uh, those questions and requests that you raised for that hearing, if that's all right. And then um, on the 911 dispatch, I know that that's something people have been contacting our office a lot about recently. So I can speak um, to that a little bit right now. Um, so obviously um, this has gotten a lot of attention this year as well. It's something that a lot of administrations have struggled with. You know, we definitely saw increased attention to this issue this year for a variety of very important reasons. In July, um, the city increased starting salaries for police and EMS dispatch up to $47,000 each. Um, since that time, we've hired, um, we started with a shortfall of 50 dispatchers. Um, we've made 26 hires since then. We've gotten three people to return. Um, we currently have 100 applications as well for the remaining positions that we're working through. Um, so that's really good news. Um, we had a first class sworn in in the end of September, and another one was sworn in just this week, actually. Um, the numbers um, are continuing to, well, I guess I should say, um, it does take a little bit of time to train uh, both EMS and police dispatchers so they can operate on their own. They'll be supervised until that point. Um, but for EMS, it's, I believe, five months before they're able to operate on their own. And then I believe police dispatchers have an eight-month training period. Um, but we've already seen call times that have been improving. At this point, my understanding is 65% of calls are being picked up within the zero to 10 second range, which of course is the key critical metric that we're continuing to monitor um, very hawkishly. Um, and then 80% of calls are being picked up within the first minute. So there's still room for improvement, but we are seeing some improvements with the new hires that we have made. Um, you know, the other there are two other pieces of this puzzle, so consolidation and cross-training and then the infrastructure. On the consolidation front, um, I know that we are continuing to move forward with that. Um, I know that police and EMS are dispatching currently from the same location and that EMS and fire have been cross-trained. The goal is to get um, EMS, fire, and police, you know, all in the same location, all cross-trained with each other. So still a little bit of work to do on that front, but there has been a lot of progress. And then um, on the, the infrastructure side, so we had gotten um, about about just shy of seven hundred thousand dollars from the feds, so that we could invest in new critical access dispatch software. Um, so that's been in the process of being implemented and upgraded for all of our dispatch facilities. And then the other piece of infrastructure, of course, is, um, as the president mentioned, that public safety access point piece. So the board appropriated um, a little over $20 million in ARPA funds for that. Um, and the governor, we had secured $23 million at the state level. Unfortunately, the governor vetoed $13 million of that. We are left with $10 million. Um, we're planning to go back and we're going to 
get the remainder and we have um, had great conversations in the interim period with um, our um, state elected officials on that and we're going to continue to advocate for that but the work on the PSAP has already begun um, with every building project in the city, there's three different phases that all of them go through. The first is the feasibility study phase. Um, the second is the design phase. And the third is the build phase. And so the feasibility study is what it sounds like, right? Like what's going on with the land? Is there remediation needs? Are there technical aspects of the construction site that we need to take into account? Um, and I know we already started that earlier earlier on this year, even before the Missouri legislative session ended. So we're if we're really quickly going to be entering into that second phase, the design phase, um, which is um, pretty self-explanatory. You know, what's the schematics of the building? The really good news is that because the city's been working on getting the PSAP since I want to say 2008 is the date that I was told there's been a lot of conversation about what the design needs are that's going to um, expedite that phase a little bit. Um, typically, design phase lasts anywhere from, I believe it's 12 to 18 months. But um, again, since a lot of the features of this have been advocated for and discussed for well over a decade, that puts us at an advantage to try to move forward a little bit more quickly on this. And then, of course, the next phase is the build phase. Um, we've been advised that we can expect the PSAP to be um, constructed by mid-late 2025 are the current initial estimates that we've been given. So, um, yeah, high-level summary is we are making progress on dispatch and consolidation and the infrastructure. There's still work to be done on all those fronts, but um, I know that there's a lot of appreciation for the investments that the board has made and, you know, and whether it's, you know, the, you know, the salary increases for our dispatchers, it's proven to be so critical, um, whether it's for investing in that infrastructure, you know, piece for the piece that allowed us to start pulling down state dollars and make that compelling case to the state. Um, so, yeah, that's where we're at currently. I know that we're continuing, like I said, to monitor those call times very hawkishly. It's a priority of Chief Coyles as well. He's um, very, very engaged on that. Um, so that's the status of that. And um, I'm happy to put something together that I can share with your office on that as well for constituents who might ask. And then, yes, we'll be happy to reach out to other folks in my office who are more in the loop on um, the street paving uh, timeline question. And then, um, yeah, with the ARPA reappropriation status projects conversation, that's something that our office is putting um, together some more detail on for that presentation um, to the board as well. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I think that's helpful for the public. You know, we're constantly hearing, you know, you're not doing anything about 911. And, and we're all, you know, sitting here saying, well, we actually have, we've done a lot. And so I, I think that's a really good um, kind of summary and, and education for the board that we can take back to our um, constituents. So as we continue to get um, information and, and ideas through the portal that we're able to say, you know, yes, we all agree that 911 is a priority and, you know, RAM settlement money may not be the best um, uh, source of funds for that because there there's already been significant resources that have been dedicated to it. And, and we're working, you know, we're waiting for the construction and, and all that to wrap up. So I I appreciate on that. That's um, all that I have for this evening. I think we had a lot of great energy and enthusiasm from the public um, and really appreciate some of the really great uh, innovative ideas. I got a few texts throughout this from people that were like, you should hire that person <laughs> into city government because they seem, you know, really engaged and in informed. So um, thank you. And I'll yield back to you, Madam Chair. Yes, um, thank you, uh, President Green, and thank you, Ms. Milberg, for that helpful information. Um, I will be short. It's been a, a three-hour meeting almost. So I want to thank all of us for hanging in there. I first want to make sure I thank our community and thank our residents for showing up, all of your engagement in the portal, all of your engagement um, today. And I know after our last meeting, I got a lot of outreach of folks, really um, some people who aren't even on the north side saying, you know, I hope that there will be some intentional efforts to do north side engagement. And so I hope you all see that we did respond to that and we're intentional. And I want to thank everyone who helped us to do that canvassing 
on the north side. I want to thank um, the public libraries for the collaboration of putting those paper applications in the libraries. One of the things that's very important to me is that we do this process as equitable as possible. And so we go and meet people where they are and put it, make sure we're not just relying on internet and portals and things like that, because we know that those can be inaccessible and unequitable for some people. So I really want to commend all the partners and many people who helped us make sure that we cover that ground. Um, I want to thank, of course, Madam Comptroller for coming out and giving that update and making some points that I think are very valid and things that I hope we will all keep in mind as we move forward. Um, of course, I want to thank the President's Office and Ms. Garmendi in particular. I know that I've seen you um, and your team working on putting in all of those many paper applications, and I know that that's, you know, tedious work, but I really appreciate you going an extra mile to make sure that we hear from all of our, our residents and our constituents. Um, and then I want to really thank all of my colleagues um, who were present today, and even some who weren't able to make it, but expressed, um, you know, that they were had some other things going on. But just you all for engaging this process. Many of you went above and beyond, whether it was National Night Out, whether it was your town halls, whether it was community events, to make sure that you were doing everything you could to make sure that your constituents knew that this process was going on and encouraging that engagement. I want to make sure that you all know if there's any questions, if you, you know, I tried the information you got today was tailored around many of what I've heard from colleagues, but if there's anything that you, maybe this ignited some further questions that you have and you want some additional information, please do not hesitate to reach out to me. We all have each other's phone numbers, but of course you can also email if there's something that you particularly want to hear about at our next meeting, please make sure that you reach out to me and let me know. I want this to be as informative, informative and educational for all of us as, as possible. Um, um, and then with that, you know, we heard some excellent ideas today, um, many of which I was happy to hear. I like that we were keeping our emphasis on transformational and, and generational so that hopefully if there's another 28 year old black woman that is chairing a committee over over $200 million, they can put that money into a different issue um, in the future. And we can work to address some of the issues that have been plaguing our city for a long time. Some of the things mentioned like public transit, I think that's a really idea, a great idea. Um, animal shelters, I think that's something that the Department of Health raised in our budget session. So that's really important. The city subsidizing childcare um, is another great idea. We know that youth are our fastest declining population. Um, ideas about after school care and working with St. Louis Public Schools to support our children. Um, and of course, I'm going to mention, you know, those of you who showed up and mentioned how can we support our unhoused community as well. I want to make sure I lift that up and thank you all for all of your input. Um, and with that, um, I will entertain a motion to continue the committee of the whole for December 2nd, 2023. So moved. Okay. It's been moved by the alder, uh, by Madam President and seconded by the Alderwoman of the First Ward to continue the Committee of the Whole December, 20, December 2nd, 2023. Um, all in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. See you all at the next meeting. Thank you.